struggle, and of course tiring. When the climber has been on top, he will momentarily enjoy the view and look down to his life to where he came from. Then, he must immediately go down to return to his life to the place he must serve for humanity. Likewise, the seeker of knowledge, he will climb the peak of science and with his knowledge, he must serve humanity. That's UNES postgraduate school. It was built for those who love knowledge, for those who are challenged to climb the peak of science, and for those who are determined to devote knowledge for humanity. As part of Universitas Negeri Semarang, which is highly accredited, postgraduate school has some visions for commitment. Commitment of conservation, commitment to build a healthy organization, commitment to achieve excellence in this global competition era, and commitment to bring prosperity to the entire academics, educators, alumni, and society based on prime public service performance. Pasca Sarjana UNES bervisi menjadi lembaga pasca sarjana yang berwawasan konservasi dan bereputasi internasional. Pasca Sarjana UNES memang dibentuk untuk pengembangan pendidikan program magister dan program doktor, baik kependidikan maupun non kependidikan, berorientasi pada kebutuhan pembangunan nasional dan internasional. Tujuannya untuk meningkatkan kualitas hidup manusia yang sehat, unggul, dan sejahtera tanpa melupakan nilai konservasi yang menjadi karakter kami. Pasca Sarjana UNES juga dibentuk untuk mewadai aktivitas penelitian dalam pengembangan ilmu pengetahuan, teknologi, dan seni juga berperan sebagai mitra pemerintah untuk bantuan konsultasi dan pelatihan dalam berbagai bidang. Tak ketinggalan, kami juga mengembangkan kerjasama institusi untuk menunjang penguatan kelembagaan yang berreputasi internasional. Yang pasti, kami tak ingin lembaga kami serupa menara gading yang asik dalam pengembangan keilmuan tanpa mempertimbangkan kebermanfaatan bagi kehidupan manusia. UNES Postgraduate School has 21 master study programs and 8 doctoral study programs. A clean and comfortable place to study always be the priority for the UNES Postgraduate School. Anyone who is in the campus area will feel at home pleasantly. This seminar becomes a very important event for the knowledge development of the academics to examine the scientific achievement, ideas, and research findings. UNES Postgraduate School organized many seminars, both nationally and internationally. In these kinds of seminars, experts in their respective fields were invited to present their intellectual thoughts. In addition to seminars, Public lectures are also often conducted by presenting experts in their respective fields. One of the lecturers in the public lecture was the director of Universitas Negeri Semarang, Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman M. Hum, who presented the topic of growing leadership. The students who have graduated in both master and doctoral programs devote their knowledge in various educational institutions. In addition to examining the knowledge obtained from UNES Postgraduate School, their work is the proof of the UNES Postgraduate alumni's devotion for humanity. Not only academic activities, the bone of togetherness and harmony among the academics is built in an atmosphere of non-academic activities. One example that is routinely done is doing gymnastic together on Friday morning. This togetherness is very important so that everyone who is part of UNES postgraduate school will have sense of handar beni, 
or sense of belonging to this campus. Assalamu alaikum. I'm Abdul Hadi Awidat. I'm from Libya. I'm so happy to study here. Program Bahasa Sarjana UNES merupakan bagian dari UNES Semarang yang mendukung visi ini. Program Bahasa Sarjana memberikan layanan pendidikan yang bermutu dengan standar di atas standar nasional. Kerjasama terus dikembangkan oleh program Bahasa Sarjana ini untuk bisa melahirkan magister dan doktor yang bisa bersaing dan bersanding dengan universitas lain di dunia. Karena itu terus program Pasar Sarjana Universitas Semarang agar maju mewujudkan UNES perluasan konservasi reputasi internasional. Choosing the right place to climb the peak of science. This is what a learner needs to do. One needs to choose a place that not only meet the scientific needs but also spiritual needs. A place that doesn't only provides practical knowledge but also encourage everyone to present their intellectual generosity. This is what UNES Postgraduate School does, a mountain of knowledge that challenge everyone to climb the peak. Akan ada masa di mana kita menjalin rasa manusia dengan semesta. Mendaki ke puncak tertinggi, menggapai tujuan dengan kerja keras dan strategi. Perjalanan mengajarkan banyak arti dalam setiap langkah yang terlewati. Bercerita lewat asa untuk terus dijaga. Manusia sejatinya berencana, menata cita-cita dalam bingkai rencana. Percaya bahwa keindahan tercipta bukan instan, melainkan lewat prinsip dan pedoman. Kreativitas dan imajinasi saling berkolaborasi, mengasah naluri, menjamah potensi. Tak akan bertemu ujung untuk apa yang kami kejar, Tak akan tercipta rasa tanpa belajar. Apa yang kami lakukan berawal dari sebuah ilmu. Ilmu yang kami emban di rumah peradaban. Universitas Negeri Semarang. Kemajuan kita sebagai bangsa tidak bisa lebih cepat daripada kemajuan kita dalam pendidikan. Pikiran dan wawasan menjadi sumber daya fundamental. Di sini saya belajar banyak hal seperti mempertajam kecerdasan, memperkukuh kemauan, dan memperhalus perasaan. Pendidikan adalah senjata paling ampuh untuk mengubah dunia, termasuk Indonesia. Berangkat dari mana? Ya dari diri kita sendiri. Inilah rumah ilmu pengembang peradaban. Tempat tunas penuh talenta tumbuh bermekaran dalam kasih sepenuh hati, bertumbuh menemu arti. UNES Gemilang untuk Indonesia Maju. Kegemilangan memandu UNES dalam melahirkan generasi berkarakter dan berprestasi. 
agar tunas muda Indonesia bertumbuh menemukan peran dan makna demi kejayaan Indonesia dalam peradaban dunia. Setia mengawal semangat perubahan demi kemajuan bangsa dan peradaban sebab kami percaya niat baik saja tak cukup denyut inovasi harus terus berdegup arom luhuring pawiatan ing astoniro semangat ini berdiam di hati terpatri di jiwa kami Selamat datang di Universitas Negeri Semarang. Gemilang untuk Indonesia Maju. Selamat datang di Universitas Negeri Semarang. Gemilang untuk Indonesia Maju. The International Conference on Science, Education and Technology, or ISET, is an annual international conference organized by Graduate School at Universitas Negeri Semarang. The conference invites researchers and practitioners to present and discuss the most recent innovations, trends, results, experiences and concerns in the diverse lenses of science, education and technology. This conference was held in 2015. 2016, the conference promoted conservation education in the era of innovation and technology. Global education through network learning was conducted in 2017. 2018, we brought global collaboration to improve the acceleration of education in the disruption era as the conference keeps updating the global trend, Digital Literacy and Industrial Revolution 4.0 was the major topic for the ISET 2019. In 2020, the conference was conducted virtually, highlighting digital transformation in science, technology and education for sustainable human quality development. 2021 is the second virtual conference on science, education, and technology. We proudly present the insightful theme on the great digital transformation in academic-driven programs, a holistic approach of challenges and opportunities. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome our Master of Ceremony, Girindra Putri Dewi Saraswati. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. We welcome you to the seventh international seminar on educational technology, ISET 2021. This is the masterpiece of UNES Graduate School, an international conference where experts of the field of education, science, social sciences, technology, and arts are gathered together to discuss the latest issues in the field. As we speak, the participants attending our Zoom reach up to 800 participants. It's very phenomenal. Thank you very much. I am Girin Raputri, acting as your Master of Ceremony. Before we start with the opening ceremony and also further agenda, I would like to greet our VIPs and participants of today's occasions. I would like to greet the Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Semarang, Professor Dr. Fatur Rahman M. Hong. Salam Pak Rektor. I would also like to greet the Honorable Vice Rectors, the Honorable Directors and Vice Directors of UNES Graduate Schools, the Honorable All Top Managements, Distinguished Guests, and all participants. A special welcome from the committee goes to the Honorable Invited Speakers, Professor Dr. Aris Junaidi, PhD, the Director of Learning and Student Affairs, 
of the Directorate General of Higher Education, Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology, the Republic of Indonesia. And also Assistant Professor Ibrahim Yetta from National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Next is Mr. David Persons, PA, and Phil, PhD, from the Mind Lab by Unitech, Auckland, New Zealand. And then Assist Assistant Professor Bob Feng Sua Sung, PhD, from the Education University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong. We also like to greet a very welcome, Selamat pagi, Professor Dr. Nurzaidi Haji Mohamed Daud from University Technology Mara, Malaysia. And the last one is our associate professor Mahalul Azam PhD from Universitas Negeri Semarang. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start with the main agenda, let me read the House of Rules of today's online conference. Okay, so uh, this is the rules of today's conference. So we will record the whole conference sessions, both plenary and parallel sessions. So by attending this conference, you acknowledge that your image and comments might be recorded and rebroadcasted. The second is to mute all the microphone during the opening sessions. Next is to click raise hand during the Q&A sessions below the participant box to ask questions or to type your questions directly in the chat box on Zoom by mentioning your name or organization, city and questions. The moderator will summarize and deliver the questions to the speakers. We would like to remind you that the chat box is used only for asking questions so you do not need to uh, I present, I'm listening and extra and the link for attendance list will be announced later. Next is uh, for you to name your account based on the rule given by the committee. So that was the house rules. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, for us to start this very morning occasions, let us all hear the national anthem of Indonesia, Indonesia Raya. You can be still in your seat and listen to the national anthem carefully. Please, this is Indonesia Raya. Thank you very much. And now the next agenda is for us to have a moment of silence for prayer. Praying begins. 
Thank you. And in order to have this plenary sessions to run well, we will have a report first from the committee chairperson. So I would like to invite Dr. Sri Ratna Rahayu, MTS PhD, to take the time. Please, Dr. Ayu, the time is yours. Thank you, Girindra. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Peace be upon you. Alhamdulillah, all praise be to Allah for giving us the strength that leads to the successful organization of this conference. Dear distinguished guests and conference participants, we are pleased to welcome you to the seventh International Conference on Science, Education, and Technology, ISET 2021. ISET is a annual international conference organized by graduate school at Universitas Negeri Semarang. The ISET 2021 programs aims to bring outstanding scholar, researcher, and student to exchange and share their research research regarding all aspects of science, education, and its application with technology. The theme of the seven is set is uh, integrating digital transformation in academic driven programs, a holistic approach of challenges and opportunities. This conference program is highlighted by seven speakers. Professor Dr. Faturman M. Hum, Rector Universitas Negeri Semarang. Professor Aris Junedi, PhD, the Director of Learning and Student Affairs of the Director General of Higher Education, Ministry of Culture, Education, Research, and Technology, Indonesia. David Person, BA, Shirt 8, MPhil, PhD, from the main lab by Unitech Auckland, New Zealand. Assistant Professor Ibrahim Yitor from the National In Institute of Education Nanyang Technology, University, Singapore. Professor Dr. Nur Zaidi Haji Mohamed Daud from the University Technology Mara, Malaysia. Assistant Professor Bob Fengsu San, PhD from the Education University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong. And Associate Professor Dr. Mahalul Azam from the Univers Universitas Negeri Semarang, Indonesia. The technical program of this conference also includes the presentation of paper. The papers for this conference were selected after the rigorous review process. We have received an overwhelming response with the, a total of the 226 papers with a competitive acceptance rate. More than 860 participants are participated of in this conference. We wish to express our deepest graduate and appreciation to the graduate school management and staff for their support and the conference committee member for their relentless effort to ensure of the smooth organization of this conference. Our deepest appreciation also goes to the author, reviewer, and volunteer for the support toward this conference. The editing of the paper for final publication was also a term effort. We thought the release this effort, this conference would not be possible. Finally, we wish you a fruitful conference and thank you for your participation. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Dr. Ayu, our chairperson of today's conference. And ladies and gentlemen, next we will have our director of UNES Graduate School, Professor Dr. Agus Nuryatin M. Hum for the uh, remarks and also to officially open the conference. For Professor Dr. Agus Nuryatin M. Hum, please, the time is yours. 
Oke, okay. thank you, Gerindra. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Please be open you. The Honorable Rector of Universitas Negeri Semarang. The Honorable all the Vice Rector at Universitas Negeri Semarang. The Honorable all the vice directors of graduate school at Universitas Negeri Semarang, distinguished speakers, Professor Aris Junedi, PhD, the director of learning and student affairs of the, the Doctorate General of Higher Education, Ministry of Culture, Education, Research and Technology, Indonesia. David Person, PhD, the mind lab by Unitech, Auckland, New Zealand. Assistant Professor Ibrahim Yater, National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Professor Dr. Nur Jaiti Haji, Muhammad Daud, Universitas Universitas Teknologi Mara Malaysia, Asisten Profesor Bob Peng Shui Sheng, PhD, Dedica Education Universitas of Hong Kong, Hong Kong, Associate Profesor Dr. Mahalul Azam, Universitas Negeri Semarang. Indonesia. The Honorable All Head of Institutes at Universitas Negeri Semarang, the Honorable All Dean of Faculties at Universitas Negeri Semarang, the Honorable All Coordinators of Study Program at Universitas Negeri Semarang. Conference participation, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of Graduate School, Universitas Negeri Semarang, and Conference and Committee members, we cordially welcome you to five international conference on science, education, and technology, I said. 2021. Academic conferences have been an important forum for building in strengthening graduate school. The series of ISET conference have been held annually since 2015. This year, the conference is held virtually for the second year running to, to the COVID-19 pandemic and restric restriction and physical conferences. We are very pleased with, with what the Great Visual has come not to hold this international conference. We hope that this conference will be successful and has a positive impact on the advances of science and technology, particularly in the field of science, education, and its application with technology. Hopefully, this conference will provide us with insight kind from the presentation of the invited speakers and sharing session with the participants. Member of 
the organizing committee has been working very hard for the success of this ICEP 2021. In this very special occasion, I would like to thank them for their dedication, time, and effort. We also wish to express our appreciation to all the other whose papers and presentation make the event a very exciting forum to add values to learn, discussion, and exchanges of ideas and to meet old or new people from different regions and countries and interact with them. Ladies and gentlemen, as request by the committee to open ICET, ICET 2021. I hereby officially open this conference. Thank you. And I wish you an full conference. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Prof. Agus Nuryati, with you delivering the remote and also to open this seminar officially. Now we can get to the next agenda, which is the keynote speech by the Rector of Universitas Negeri Semarang. Bapak Rektor, Bapak Profesor Dr. Fatur Rahman M. Hu, this is the time for the keynote speech. So please, the time is yours. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. First of all, I would like to express my gratitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for his blessing and mercy that we could meet in this seventh international conference on science, education, and technology or ISET. On behalf of Universitas Semarang, allow me, Rector of UNES, take great pleasure in welcoming you all speakers, Professor Dr. Anis Aris Junedi, PhD. Thank you for your coming. Associate Professor Ibrahim Yeter, David Persons, PA, PhD. Associate Professor Bob Pengguasun, PhD. Professor Dr. Nur Saidi Haji Muhammad Daud, and Associate Professor Mahalul Azam, PC, Vice Rector, Dean, Vice Dean, especially Director, Vice Director, and of course, all presenters and participants in this seventh ISET. Let me introduce the vision of UNES to be a conservation inside university with international reputation. This international conference is relevant to develop, to accelerate our vision, especially in the pillar of international reputation. UNES has spirit a host of knowledge 
Here we always build our campus to develop civilization in producing quality of human resources in various fields in order to make better life. Disruption changes conventional patterns to digital. The innovation of education is being the core of daily needs for today's era. And yes, it is challenging. The emergency of innovative application in the world can make it easier for everyone to seek knowledge wherever and whenever in this pandemic era. We also understood well that online learning has been exposed to various challenges during this global pandemic, especially in Indonesia. Some schools and parents do support the rule of online learning like in this uh, picture. But some of us cannot spot the current situation. Of course, we need collaboration between school, parents, and the governments to make the, le the learning run well. We do not, we do need theoretical of innovation, education, response to this disruption to create the solution. UNES, as a host of knowledge, we are growing and continuing to innovate, including in developing virtual learning and other academic activities. UNES also responds that regulation by enhancing the current learning management system in LMS UNES. Elena is connected to the integrated academic system and facilities virtual learning for regular lectures, programs, and also for lectures and student exchange uh, program. As we know, the disruption era is the occurrence of fundamental changes in all aspects of life by campus mengajar. UNES students successfully innovative, innovate a distance learning system by using the LAPAN satellite to answer today's problem. This is the one example, the innovative that created by UNES uh, student. Ladies and gentlemen, as a rector, I am so happy this is said, rise an update issue in this conference by having a great theme in the creating digital transformation in academic driven program, a holistic approach of challenges and opportunities. This theme was chosen to offer Shadow the field of education and it is expected to be an innovation center, mainly the learning innovation for digital 
transformation. It means graduate school of UNES fully supports the vision of UNES in reaching international reputation. Hopefully, from this conference, will in increase the number of publication in 2021. And thank you to all the committee. This is a good job for the Pasca Sarjana UNES. And in the end of my speech, let me read the quote from Naum Chomsky. Optimism is a strategy for making a better future. Because unless you believe that the future can be better, you are unlikely to step up and take responsibility for making it so. Optimism is a strategy for making a better future. Thank you very much for your attention. Enjoy the seventh I said. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you very much, Bapak Rektor, for the keynote speech. It was very insightful. Ladies and gentlemen, and also Bapak Rektor, and all distinguished participants, before we proceed to the plenary sessions, we would like to have a photo sessions. So please uh, turn the camera on for participants who hasn't turned on the camera, and we'll have a photo session shortly. Okay, so we will start with the first uh, participants in page one, we have like 36 pages here right now in this conference, so uh, please be patient. So this is the first page, please. Uh, okay, please smile, we'll uh, take your picture. Okay, next, uh, second slide. Thank you. The third slide. Thank you. Please be patient. We'll have 35 slides. Okay, thank you. Next, the fourth page. Again, okay, then the fifth page. The sixth. Thank you. The seventh page. The eighth page. The name. Okay, the next page, the tenth, we'll have Bapak Director here, and then the next eleventh page. Next, page twelve. Okay, next, the third uh, page thirteen. Okay, and then page fourteen. Thank you. Page 15. Thank you. Page 16. We have uh, Prof. Nuri here. Okay, next page 17. Page 18, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, and then the next pages. Well, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for the photo sessions. We'll send uh, Pak Rector a virtual applause from your computer. Thank you very much, Bapak. And thank you very thank much. Thank you, Bapak. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you very much also for all top management and our VIPs who has attended our conference. We will be happy to have you all here to have another session. We will have two plenary sessions, sessions one and session two with a very distinguished uh, invited speakers.
Thank you very much for having us. Okay, next, ladies and gentlemen, is the very moment that we have been waiting for, which is the plenary sessions. The first plenary sessions will be led by our moderator, Ibu Zulfa Sakia, PhD. Ibu Zulfa Sakia, PhD, will lead uh, the sessions with uh, speakers, Assistant Professor Ibrahim Yatta from the Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Mr. David Persons, PhD from the Mind Lab by Unitech, New Zealand, and also Associate Professor Mahalul Azam, PhD from Universitas Negeri Semarang. Our moderator, Ibu Sulfa Sakia, PhD, is uh, one of our lecturers at the English Education Study Program of UNES Graduate School. So with further further ado, I would like to give the time to the moderator. Please, the time is yours. Am I audible? Yes, Ibu. Yeah. Thank you, Ibu Gerindra. Uh, Bapak Rektor, Bapak Direktur, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first plenary session of the 7th ISEP 2021. I am Zulfa Sahya, and I'm going to moderate this first plenary session. We are very lucky indeed that in this first plenary session, we have three invited speakers. We have Associate Professor Ibrahim Yater from National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Hello, Dr. Yater. Good morning. Morning. Um, and it's also still morning in Singapore, yes? And yeah, we also correct. have uh, Dr. David Persons uh, from MindLab Unitech, Auckland, New Zealand. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, um, Dr. Parsons. Yes, it's good afternoon from oh, me. Good afternoon, Thank you. yes. Yes. Um, I really miss that um, New Zealand's accent. And we have <laughs> Associate Professor Mahalul Azam, uh, PhD from Universitas Negeri Semarang. Good morning, Pa Azam. Yeah, um, so our three prolific speakers will highlight the importance of digital technology and digital literacy in learning and the education sector in general. Um, we're going to have around one and a half hours to explore this very important issue, especially because uh, during this pandemic, uh, where learning and teaching occurs in the digital space. Uh, but before that, firstly, I'd like to remind you to mute yourself and carefully listen to our speakers. And if you have any questions along the way, please drop them in the chat box. And I'm going to read your questions uh, later in the question and answer session. Um, each of our speakers will speak for about 20 minutes, so we'll have enough time to discuss the talk in the question and answer session later. That's a bit about the rules in this friendly session. Um, I'm sure you can't wait to listen to our um, speakers. Uh, but before listening to the talks, uh, let me introduce you to um, our first speaker. Uh, the slide, please. Um, so first, we've got Associate Professor Ibrahim Yata uh, from the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Um, you might want to check your audio, uh, Dr. Yata. Yes, can you hear me yes. now? Yes, very audible, right. thank you. Um, so Dr. Yeter um, is an assistant professor in the National Institute of Education at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Uh, before joining NTU, he was appointed as a postdoctoral research fellow in the John Paulson School of Engineering and Applied Sciences at Harvard University and the School of Engineering Education in the College of Engineering at Purdue University in 2019 to 20 and 2017 to 19 respectively. Um, he is now an affiliated faculty member of the Center for Research and Development in Learning at NTU and is the director of the World Moon Project, which has enabled several thousand students and their teachers worldwide to collaborate on aerospace engineering and STEM-based um, education uh, focused activities. He has worked in several international and national projects related to computational thinking and pedagogy, 
engineering education and learning analytics with the pre-K 16 education level. Um, aside from these areas, this current research also focuses on artificial intelligence for education, machine learning education, educational psychology, and assessments. We are very lucky to have uh, Dr. Yete on board. And in this uh, talk, uh, Dr. Yete is going to talk about navigating the digital world, characterizing computational thinking practices in the field of artificial intelligence and machine learning education. Dr. Yete, the time is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dr. Zufa, thank you very much for your kind introduction. Uh, I'd like to start off by thanking everyone for having me today uh, to have a chance to share my works. As you mentioned, the title of the conversation is going to be Navigate in the Digital World, Characterizing Computational Thinking Practices in the Field of Artificial Intelligence and Machine Learning Education. If I may uh, move forward, I'd like to uh, give you a little bit of context about myself. My type of like bread and butter research is more on engineering education and computational thinking. This has been quite of my interest for some time, but I recently developed an interest in artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning education, just because these two fields have a lot of overlapping status with computational thinking and slightly in engineering design models. So be, while giving you this context, uh, I will also go ahead and share with you some of the characteristics that this field, how it overlaps with computational thinking. <clears throat> but additionally, I'd like to go ahead and give you some little bit more introduction about the local that I am in. So in Singapore, uh, this field of engineering, computational thinking, artificial intelligence, and machine learning fields it really plays a significant role in, in, in Singapore's economical structure. Uh, this has been uh, one of the main components of Singaporean setting. And uh, the, the role of the economy in manufacturing, electronics, chemical, biochemicals, marine offshore engineering, it has been one of the main domains in, in, in engineering concepts. Uh, so the agenda for UN 2030 there is an agenda to, to reach out this sustainable development and Singapore is doing everything to reach out to this, this, this concept. And in order to build up uh, uh, the skills for individuals, there is a term called skills future. And for that, uh, engineering practices, artificial intelligence practices, uh, machine learning, as well as the computational practices are being embedded very significantly in, in the school setting. And, and additionally, there are some concepts of the educational implementations. Again, those are being heavily emphasized for, through the STEM plus C. STEM is science, technology, engineering, mathematics plus C. C stands for the computational thinking activities. Uh, I would like to take you to show you some of the works that I have previously done, and which is a figure that I would like to uh, have you all to dive in together about this concept of the learning theories. We all know that theories that are allowing us to, to follow some structures and, and, and have the confirmatory you know, approaches on or on, on our understanding. So one of the learning theories is about the social constructivism. This is just only one example, which was influenced by Piaget, Vygotsky, and Brunner. Uh, we are all clear on that, but some aspects of it that when it comes to the learning setting, learning and teaching environment, what we realize is that there are so many uh, unexplored area, even though there has been studies on that, but still it is hard to really understand uh, how the relationships are working, for example, between the teacher's beliefs and practices, as well as the student's beliefs and practices. And from the teacher's standpoint, how these practices are influencing the ideal teaching model that is being proposed by stakeholders, uh, by curriculum developers, by, by, by professional developers, and so on. So if you look at this, this figure closely, what you're going to see that in this green area, that has not been clearly explored and, and still has issues to, to, to tackle it all together. And 
some examples that I provided here in terms of the main indicators, what those are. This could be expanded in a large setting area, but let's say in engineering context, you would say that engineer reflection, engineer project engagement, and engineering teamwork. And so as we all can accept this notion, reflection and uh, project engage engagement and teamwork would be one of the main indicators for, for STEM plus C environment. How, would you, would you uh, apply this in other uh, non-STEM disciplines? Yes, you can definitely apply this also non-STEM discipline as well. Uh, let, let's call it in, in another example, which is going to be more on the uh, medical field. Uh, in medical field, as you know, that teamwork is one of the essential uh, approach uh, to, to conduct the, the, the projects in the, in the medical, medical environment. So let us move to the next slide, which is about the computational thinking. So what is computational thinking and what makes computational thinking to be so important and critical in our learning environment? Well, computational thinking has been mentioned previously by Pepper, Samuel Pepper, but the most recent uh, interaction and, and, uh, was provided by Janet Wings. And computational thinking competencies and practices have been receiving a great deal of attention from several groups of professionals, uh, not only by teachers, not only by K-12 settings, but also stakeholders, by professional developers, by curriculum developers, and so many more, and policymakers as well. And notably, including researchers, again, practitioners, uh, all these uh, the development providers. So according to Janet Wings, uh, that she uh, provided one of the uh, landmark articles, uh, and she suggests that computational thinking represents universal applicable attitude and skill set that everyone, uh, not just computer scientists, would be eager to learn and use. Additionally, other uh, scholars, what they suggest is that computational thinking is the conceptual foundation required to solve problems effectively and efficiently with solutions that are reusable in different contexts. So to provide further information on that, there are several definitions of computational thinking as it has been developed recently. But what we know is that, we, what we also agree on that, you know, computational thinking is a type that univer provides universal thought process. So it is towards two problem solving strategies. Additionally, uh, the, the, the problem that comes into the play about the computational thinking is about the teacher preparedness, teacher readiness, and, and the implementation level. And some curriculum, they are not ready to implement those practices. Therefore, there are some other projects that are embedded with these computational thinking practices that could enable the learning environment and teaching methodologies to be more effective. There are some examples which I can provide at a later stage, but right now, let's, let's continue to focus on what is not computational thinking. That would be quite interesting if I ask, we have over, you know, quite a big number of sample size here, audience here. So I will not go through asking the question on that, but if I may just go straight forward. So computational thinking is not only about coding or programming. Computational thinking is not another name for computer science or computer engineering. Uh, and yes, we acknowledge that this is not easily uh, defined and measured just because it has been a recent development in this, this field. And, and yet to explore further uh, other unexplored variables. And, and this is not something only for technical scholars or researchers or professionals need to know about it. This is applicable for every individual across the different disciplines, again, with STEM and non-STEM fields. So what are the competencies? So what, what kind of competencies do we have or exist out there that we can call it computational thinking competencies? So there are up to 11, 12, you can name it even more, but there are currently 11 existing computational thinking competencies. So what those are is that abstraction. So what abstraction stands for is identifying and utilizing the structure of concept or main ideas based on like simplification, providing more simplification that are essential for you to know. 
and, and remove the irrelevant you know, information. As the next one would be algorithms and procedure. So what that stands for, it is following, identifying, using, and creating an ordered set of instructions. Uh, for instance, through selections, iterations, and recursion. And the next one is automation. Automation is assigning appropriate sets of tasks to be done repetitively by computers. So in this case, for automation, you will need aid from computers or technological tools. And data collection is gathering information pertained to solve a problem. And another one is the data analysis, which is making sense of data, identifying the trends across different data sets or within or between different data sets. And another one is the data representation. Uh, this is organizing and depicting data in appropriate ways to demonstrate relationships among data points via representations such as graphs, uh, it could be uh, words, or it could be images as well, or charts. So how about debugging and troubleshooting? Again, those are the computational thinking competences that are exist out there. So debugging or troubleshooting, it can be named separately or differently or together, identifying and addressing problems that inhibit progress towards a task, task uh, completion. And problem decomposition, uh, which is one of the main indicators of computational thinking competencies, which I'm gonna come in the next couple of slides. So problem decomposition is about breaking down a big chunk of data uh, or, or a big chunk of problem that you have to put into the smaller pieces or process or problems uh, to make it more manageable components to solve a, 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 a large sense of the problem. Uh, so this is about the breaking down into smaller chunks. And the next one is parallelization. So what that stands for, so uh, spontaneously processing smaller tasks to more efficiently reach a goal. So you have problems, you are reaching out at this, uh, you're having the two pro uh, sub problems, trying to solve it together. And as you move along with that, which requires a different team, teamwork angle uh, characteristics, you work and try to make the task to be answered or to find solutions for both at the same time simultaneously and merge the results together to make the final conclusion on that. And the next uh, CT competency is the pattern recognition. And what pattern recognition stands for, it is observing patterns, trends, and the regularities in data. This definition was also provided by Google. So uh, you need to look for the, uh, the commonalities, similarities, you know, and, and across the uh, giving the data. One is that the final one is the simulation. So simulation stands for developing a model or representation to imitate natural and artificial process. These may require some computer assistance, uh, but this also requires non-computer assistance as well, which if we have time, I will provide further explanations on that. However, among all those 11 competencies, there are studies suggest that there are four main pillars of the CT competencies. However, there are also additional one more competencies, which is going to be abstraction, algorithms and procedures, problem decomposition, pattern recognition. As I mentioned earlier, there is also one additional competencies that we may consider as the five main CT competencies. They are the main pillars of the computational thinking. So other than the rest of the six, we are going to emphasize on abstraction, algorithms and procedures, problem decomposition, pattern recognition, debugging, and troubleshooting. So those five are the main pillars of the computational thinking competencies or practices that's being used. So how can we use these computational thinking applications in artificial intelligence and machine learning environment? Well, there are some aspects of it. Let's try to move to uh, giving you some examples on pre previously done works. And previously done works 
through various aspects of the computational thinking, which uh, brings us to discuss about the computational pedagogy. So computational pedagogy, what that stands for, uh, a professor, a distinguished professor, and now professor from SUNY Blackboard, Osman Yashar, what he suggests that uh, there are several uh, issues that teachers are going through it. So teaching with technology still remains as a challenge, uh, still unexplored area of uh, implementation. And what that makes it is that this makes to be quite difficult for teachers uh, to be skilled and, and provide a sense of the, the effective implementation of the computational thinking. So what he suggests that the computational thinking terms could help teachers to implement those practices more effectively. To do so, there is a program that he developed at his CMCT Institute uh, that could provide this computational thinking modeling and simulation technology applications that could be used as a package of TPEC could be implemented in, in his, his work. And he talks about this Dusky's five level of the uh, profession development, which is uh, participants, uh, reactions, teachers to uh, develop learning, uh, organization support and change, teacher use of new knowledge and skills, and finally students learning outcomes. Additionally, he talks about this as the computational theory of mind and master, computational theory of everything, which overlaps big time with AI, artificial intelligence, and machine learning environment. So according to him, a uh, network uh, cosmologist suspect that a single universal law or process may be guiding the growth or network systems. So what that may include in, in, in human being could be about brain cells, galaxies, and, uh, and, and galaxies, but in, in our daily life, which is uh, macro level. But in, in, in technicality, it could be about internet. Uh, it could be about uh, uh, artificial uh, intelligence aspects of the practices. Uh, and what he also suggests that uh, in, in the nature and the origin of such a process that may be common to all these systems remain elusive. So what further he suggests is that computational pedagogy could be in two different aspects. One is that the deductive pedagogy Another one is inductive pedagogy. So in inductive pedagogy, modeling is simplification of reality. It eliminates details and draws attention to what is being studied. It enables the learner to grasp important facts surrounding a topic before revealing details. Whereas inductive pedagogy is the simulation provides a dynamic medium for the learner to conduct scientific experiments in a friendly, uh, playful, predictive, eventful, and interactive way to test the hypothetical scenarios. So these allows the learner to go into the initial models details and break into it is constitutive parts in order to run various what if scenarios. And this what if scenario provides more rigorous and concrete meaningful approach for individuals to be able to engage in the learning environment. So to make it a little bit more clear and what the sense for is that, so again, from the general to more details, inductive and deductive reasoning, what he's providing for, for that aspects of it, this is the deductive reasoning from the top to down and inductive reasoning from the bottom to top. So is, if you realize that in inductive reasoning, you are going towards to more general sense of it, and from the doctor reasoning, you're going more detailed sense of the applications. And that actually works in artificial intelligence and machine learning environment, because for machine learning environment, you do provide lots of data in order to make sure that all these fine details are being placed properly and, and accordingly in return so that it can provide you the best interpretations of the outcomes. Okay, so to move forward in the next one, okay. Uh, so let's say, let's try to make this more concrete. In our daily life, we have a problem. And let's focus on one problem. So when uh, solving a problem, we have to consider 
and assess first the amount of the data available. And if there is not much data, then we have to consider the type of the knowledge required to solve that problem. If it is mainly heuristic, then we have to specify the roles and build the code. So let's, let's try to move on that. So again, you as an individual human being, you need to uh, assess your knowledge of expertise, the type of expertise that you have it. And that goes into the section of the, whether heuristics or, and if that's heuristics, then you do provide you know, the rules or programs to execute uh, the, the problem. And if there's the scientific theories, uh, then you do provide the computational models uh, as, as human being. But how about from the machine learning environment? Uh, from machine learning environment, what you do is that you do uh, assess whether that data was provided in advance, whether that type of like machine learning setting that has the solution for it. If you recall that from inductive and deductive reasonings in fine details, you need to provide the sufficient data so that you know, the machine can uh, provide uh, more rigorous interpretations on that. And what that stands for is that here, if there is registered to provide solutions, the, if, if not registered, then simply it will not give you the feedback on that. But if it does, then it will provide the feedback on solutions. Again, if you please pay attention here, type of knowledge of expertise and machine learning and how, how it actually uh, come together and in terms of the human being and then the machine environment, this is the counterpart that, that connects to each other. And additionally, scientific theories or heuristic approach versus registered points in, in machine learning environment or not. And to move forward, this is also the analysis that you make it as a human being, but whereas in machine learning environment, there is a calculation if this is a register that provides the information accordingly. And one thing about the machine learning, it requires to have lots of data so that it can provide more meaningful interpretations. And whereas for the types of the expertise in, in, in human being, you don't have to, you do have this, this type of like you know data, but for concrete examples of the approach, uh, uh, you, 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 have, you, you don't have to really use all of these you know, cognitive moves uh, to, to, to get the solutions on that. So studies suggest that there are three types of the humanistic competencies for using computational thinking in, in the sense of the artificial intelligence, statistical thinking, and so on. So Isoda suggests that competencies are to lead, to leave, to work. So competencies to lead, what they suggest that, is through creating the new value on infrastructural basis. Uh, this could be about fourth industrial revolution. And the competencies to work is that through predicting the future society with negative and positive aspects. And whereas to leave is finding the own value for humanistic oriented activity on the digital society. And this could be embedded within the AI and robotics environment that requires to have the machine learning applications. And this is also another uh, implementation of how we can bring these type of like applications into uh, the world of the K-12 settings or even higher education as well. So this is a very comprehensive model that was provided by EPEC. Uh, and uh, this, this EPEC is the uh, the, the, the work that was recently done in, in March 2021. Uh, and uh, this EPEC stands for Asia Pacific Economy Corporation and uh, by the Human Resources uh, Development Working Group. Uh, this was taken from there. And so the conceptual framework, it is uh, very uh, comprehensively being defined and uh, try to provide the interdisciplinary connections and how these uh, work can be done as an, as an embedded perspective with machine learning, with data science, and, and, and with the uh, aspects of the computational thinking. Uh, again, this is a very comprehensive uh, methodology and framework. Uh, since we are running out of time, I will, I will go ahead and skip this, one, uh, skip this one for now. So there are examples of the STEM-C uh, projects that could be embedded into the K-12 settings. One quick example would be about the World Moon Project. World Moon Project is free access to all uh, 
students and teachers across the globe. Uh, so far, we have reached over, you know, uh, Brazil, China, United States, uh, and, and so many other countries. Uh, and this has four main phases. And the phase one, it takes six weeks to observe. Phase two takes three weeks to uh, observe and provide essays and, and analysis. And week three provides, uh, has three weeks and provides global patterns, essay and analysis. In fourth week, where it, well, it takes the three weeks, but where students across the different hemisphere and, uh, and, and, and across different countries, they do pro exchange their uh, essays so that they can have a meaningful interpretations of how moon functions. How about the computational thinking uh, fits to this, this program? Uh, there are aspects of the each page and with different computational thinking applications. Again, abstraction, algorithm procedures, data collections, simulations, pattern recognition, problem decomposition, debugging, and, and, and uh, troubleshooting. To wrap up this, 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 this talk, CT obviously provides lots of opportunities and benefits to the classroom, but at the same time, we acknowledge that there are challenges as well. So the benefits would be is that it provides interdisciplinary connections, it, it fits to STEM and non-STEM fields, and this could be about even music, language, arts, and economy. Uh, so it has lots of uh, implications in artificial intelligence as well as machine learning. It has the overlapping status with that. So in order to benefit this and to maximize the learning outcomes, students, they need to start to be exposed in an earlier age in order to maintain this interest in the field, as well as to enhance their computational thinking competencies over the time. And uh, additional benefits could be that these also improve their analytical thinking, critical thinking, and self-confidence in students. Studies out there suggest that uh, this uh, improves their sense of uh, accountability, as well as the sense of the confidence in learning and teaching environment. Yes, again, we acknowledge that there are challenges, for example, about the teacher readiness, uh, about the curriculum, uh, where to embed these practices. Now the world is going through a very rapid change, but those practices could be done very easily. And with the spirit of UNES, uh, House uh, of Knowledge and Developing the Culture, I, I, I am very confident that computational thinking could be, with, with AI and ML, uh, machine learning uh, applications, could be very well applicable and expanded its applications uh, in educational settings in Indonesia, as well as in different countries. Uh, this is my contact information. And uh, I believe we are going to leave the questions for Q&A sessions. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Yeta, for the very inspiring talk. And thank you for demystifying the myth in computational thinking. And I would agree that it's not merely um, about coding or language programming, it's more than that. And actually, there are many potentials to apply computational thinking in school setting, uh, married them with um, artificial intelligence and maybe other technologies. Uh, but how is this computational thinking as part of digital technology competencies relevant to transform education and teacher education? Our second speaker, uh, Dev, Dr. David Parsons of MindLab New Zealand, is going to explore this issue. Um, and we have a slide for this, uh, please. Um, Dr. David Parsons is the National Postgraduate Director at the MindLab New Zealand. It's an award-winning innovative education provider. And I still remember vividly when I was pursuing my PhD in Auckland University back then in 2015, my colleagues and professors were discussing about MindLab and how it has the potentials to transform education. Um, David holds a PhD in information technology and a master degree in electronics and computer science from the United Kingdom. He has extensive international experience in both academia and IT companies, including IBM and Oracle. Um, David is the founding editor-in-chief of the International Journal of Mobile and Blended Learning and has published books on computer programming, web application development, 
mobile learning and industry methods in education, as well as over 150 academic articles. He is currently the president of the International Association for Mobile Learning and a certified member of the Association for Learning Technologies. And in this session, Dr. Parson is going to address the issues in digital transformation in teacher education. Without any further ado, Dr. Parsons, the time is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation to speak to everybody today. Um, my topic is going to be uh, digital transformation in teacher education. And um, I'm obviously picking up the theme of the conference. So um, when I looked at the particular theme for uh, this year's conference, integrating digital transformation in academic driven programs, um, what I want to pick up from that um, is the value and design of academic programs for educators to help them in digital transformation in their practice. I will be talking um, to some extent about the program that I run in New Zealand as an example, um, but I'm going to begin with some broader themes uh, that we need to address in terms of teacher education. Um, this particular slide, as you can see, comes from uh, digital inclusion material that comes from the International Telecommunication Union on the digital inclusion of youth. Um, and of course, at the end of the day, when we talk about upskilling teachers in digital technologies, the reason that we want to do it is to make sure that young people um, have the correct skills, both for the job market and for society at large. And it's only by um, ensuring that everybody gets this that we can address um, sustainable development goal number eight, which is about decent work for all and economic growth. And of course, this whole process also links very closely with um, sustainable goal number four, which is about um, everybody having equal access to education. So these are very important global goals that we're attempting to address. Um, one thing that's been very common lately, of course, is talking about teachers upskilling because of COVID. And I just wanted to make it clear, of course, that it's not just about COVID. Uh, this is a series of um, uh, headlines that I've taken from different articles recently, and they're from all around the world. There's um, one from Malaysia, there's one from India, there's one from Ireland, there's a few other places. And so this has become a big debate lately, um, almost as if uh, teachers, because they went online um, in lockdowns, were therefore uh, digitally enabled. But of course, there's much more to it than just being able to teach using Zoom, for example. Um, I was fortunate last year to be involved in the Horizon report that was recently published. Um, and I think there's two key areas here from the Horizon report. One is about curriculum. And there's definitely a role here in terms of the importance of having a curriculum that directs education institutions towards digital skills. But also there's that wider area of the digitalized educational landscape. So there is a curriculum layer but I think there's another layer too that we need to address. Um, I'll briefly talk about curricula. Uh, these are some international curricula. Of course, they're just examples from around the world. There are many others. Um, and we can see that over recent years, many countries have started to put in place specific um, digital technologies curricula uh, that are for their schools. So in my region, for example, in Australasia, both Australia and New Zealand have recently implemented new curricula. It's in the uh, Chinese five-year plan for education. Um, in England, they revised the primary curriculum to give a stronger focus on computing. In Kenya, the 2017 Jubilee Manifesto focused on ICT skills, digital literacy. And even in the US, although there is no national curriculum, the US Department of Education has released documents such as Future Ready Learning. So there's already a lot of work being done on curriculum, but often what we tend to think about is just curriculum about the technology. Um, I'd like to choose a couple of examples that show um, directions that are not just about having a digital technology curriculum. One of them is the microbit in schools. Now, of course, microbits are used internationally, but the most important location was in the UK where every uh, school student 
in year seven was given a micro bit in 2016. And there are several um, research projects on the website of the microbit website talking about different studies, but I chose some data from one of them here from uh, Ireland because it wasn't focused as some of them are on, for example, computational thinking and coding. That is things which are seen as digital curriculum uh, elements. What I wanted to point out is this idea of um, getting beyond the digital curriculum into the broader curriculum. For example, here, 90% of pupils found the microbit useful for solving problems. And it's that broader application that I'd like to focus on. And I think a good example of that is one laptop per child. Since 2005, that's provided more than 3 million laptops in more than 60 countries. And of course, that's not about uh, children necessarily learning to code or focusing on computational thinking, but it's integrating digital skills into their overall learning. Um, so what's required? What, are we, what is it that we need to do in order to make something work where we can um, have that happening across education? So the first thing is we need to transform teacher education. Um, we can't change schools, we can't change universities without changing the way that we educate educators. Um, and we can't rely on a small number of specialist teachers to carry that burden. I'm just going to talk a little bit about um, the qualifications of teachers. So uh, one question to think about is, well, how well are our teachers qualified? And this varies a lot across the world. So, for example, in some countries, teachers have to have a master's degree. Um, in fact, 13 countries around the world demand a master's degree for teachers. Uh, in the US, some states require a master's degree, um, not all of them, but even so, more than half US teachers have a postgrad qualification. But of course, that's not all around the world. Many countries have a minority of teachers qualified at postgraduate level. And of course, there are many countries where uh, teachers may be completely lacking in any teacher training. For example, um, primary teachers in sub-Saharan Africa, only 64 have received received teacher training, only 71% in South Asia. So there's a big, big range of teacher qualification. Now, does that matter? Does it matter to what level our teachers are educated? Well, there's a lot of research into this. And interestingly, a lot of it suggests that just having well-qualified teachers doesn't make any difference. However, there are particular areas where it does make a difference. For example, if the subject matter of the degree is relevant to the teaching context. Now, if it's for younger children, studying education itself can be very relevant. But if we're talking about more senior students, it's all about being an expert in your field. So for example, it's been shown that if we have a mathematics teacher with a postgraduate mathematics qualification, uh, the teaching and learning will be improved. And so we might assume that if we train uh, teachers postgraduate in technology, that the technology learning of students will improve. However, there are some other important factors. Another is that teachers also have to um, raise their teaching quality through positive changes in beliefs and practices. So it's not enough just to learn the subject area. Teachers also need to develop their pedagogy. And that pedagogy has to be based on research informed practice. And if these things are in place, we can expect a positive outcome in learning. So um, how do we upskill our workforce in teachers? Well, there are many things that go on in schools. For example, professional development that takes place in schools. Sometimes external consultants get brought in. There's plenty of resources online, materials and so on that teachers can use. But often this is not enough for sustained changes in practice because the length of the learning is too short and teachers don't have time to do things. They need something a little more formal where time is set aside for study. Um, so how can we do that? What tools and strategies can we use to upskill the teaching workforce to help them to enable the digital age and prepare their students for the digital future? So I am now going to turn my attention to the program that I'm responsible for. I'm not suggesting this is a model that can just be copied everywhere and work for everybody, but there are some themes within it that I'd like to um, focus on. 
So the program we have is a 35 week part time postgraduate certificate and since 2014 we've upskilled about 10% of the New Zealand teaching workforce that's about 5000 teachers. Um, and what I'd like to do is to pick out some of the key aspects of this as we go through. Um, I think I'd like to characterize the program as not being technology first, and it's not about learning to use particular technologies. It's actually about modeling the integration of tools into the learning process by exposing them to many tools and doing that in a way that they're embedded into activities that also explore pedagogy and new ways of thinking about teaching and learning. So it's not really about knowledge and, and learning and reiterating knowledge, but much more about practical application. So the participants um, innovate in a research informed way in their own teaching practice as part of the assessment. So changing practice is an assumed part of the course. Digital technologies integrated right across the program to look at different ways in which teaching and learning can take place in the contemporary and digital world. And we deliberately choose tools that are easy to use and that are freely available. In fact, we provide the teachers with a, a public uh, Google site. This is available to anybody, which just uh, we keep as a, as a resource. It's got about 50 different tools on it in 11, 11 categories. So we have tools, for example, for online debating, mixed reality, indigenous languages, 3D modeling, and so on. Um, and of course, the tools in this site revolve all the time, but the basic uh, areas of study tend to stay quite consistent. But of course, it's not just about the technology. What we try to do also is to embed the technology into broader themes in contemporary learning. One example would be agile and lean thinking. Uh, and indeed, the book on the right hand side there, uh, we published in 2019, gathering together ways in which agile and lean concepts can be used for teaching and learning. And there are many other themes that we bring into the program, uh, entrepreneurship, wisdom of crowds, reflective practice, sustainability, and so on. So it's not just about the technology, but it's about bringing new ideas of teaching and learning at the same time as new ideas about technology. We also provide a lot of flexibility for our students. Uh, we've learned over time that we need to make it available fully online, including synchronous face-to-face -face sessions online, or in blended mode with some face-to-face. -face. So one thing we've learned is to try to provide students with many options so that uh, study becomes appropriate for their own circumstances. Um, this is a fairly old article, but I just wanted to pick up two of the quotes, student feedback from the program. The one at the top talks about integrating technology and digital skills into the curriculum. And so that really addresses the curriculum side of uh, that horizon report, but also the other side of that, which is changing pedagogy. So for example, the other uh, student feedback, um, being able to guide and empower my students to take ownership of their learning. And so that's the, the other aspects to this. We've got the digital side, we've got the curriculum, but we've also got the changing pedagogy, which is supported by those tools. Um, of course, the program that we offer in New Zealand is just for New Zealand, but if anybody uh, is interested in what we do, we have recently put uh, some content available on the Future Learn platform. Now, the one on the right there, which is called Digital and Collaborative Teaching and Learning, is a paid micro-credential. Um, but the one on the left, Teaching Digital Skills for Sustainable Education, um, is a free short course. Um, so if anybody is interested in having a look at the kinds of things that we do, some of the sample materials that we use with our students, um, that's freely available on the Future Learn platform. I'm just going to sort of conclude my talk by giving a brief summary of some of the key ideas that I've tried to incorporate into my talk. Um, so the first overarching idea, of course, is this concept that all teachers, not just some teachers, need to have an opportunity for professional development in service while they're teaching in digital fluency so they can bring that to their students. So the, the key ideas that I've tried to, to address have been, it's not just about curricula in terms of those that address digital tools, but it's about learning across the curriculum. 
It's about contextualizing digital skills into new and different ways of teaching and learning. It's about focusing on simple and free tools that can easily be integrated into learning activities by both teachers and students. It's about bringing along both the technologies and the pedagogies together. It's about giving teachers flexible learning options. And ultimately, it's about providing education which leads to practical application in the classroom informed by research. Um, so thank you very much for your time. Uh, it's been a pleasure to be here and I hope you found that talk of some interest. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Parsons, for the very inspiring talk. And I would agree with you that we cannot rely on our teachers to ensure that our students are digitally fluent. So the challenges abound uh, might be huge, but the upscaling strategies uh, that you have just explained are really central to realize the goal from leadership, designing curriculum to targeting core pedagogical competencies of teachers. But how is this all uh, resonating in the Indonesian context? Our third speaker, Associate Professor Mahalul Azam, um, will um, explore about this. Uh, but just before that, I'd like to read his uh, bio, short bio, um, the slide, please, from the IT backup. So Dr. Mahalul Azam is Associate Professor in Epidemiology, Public Health Department, Universitas Negeri Semarang, Indonesia. And he obtained his doctoral degree in Medicine and Health Science from Diponegoro University in 2018. Dr. Azam also works as Medical Consultant in National Sport Committee, Central Java, Indonesia, or it's familiar with uh, KONI, Jawa Tengah. Uh, Dr. Azam is also a medical doctor and affiliated as a member in the Indonesian Medical Doctor Associations, or IDI, Indonesia Public Health Association, Indonesia Association for Small Health, and Indonesia Epidemiological Association. And in this session, um, Dr. Azam is going to bring up the issue on the digital technologies in the public health response to COVID-19 and the university's role simultaneously with the MBKM programs um, or the emancipated learning. Dr. Azam, the time is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Bu Zulfa. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning, everyone. Uh, let me share my slide. Uh, is it my voice and audio visual okay? Yes, you are audible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for, for uh, the organizing committee. Uh, to give me opportunity to share uh, our thoughts here. It is uh, an honor uh, for me uh, to present my presentation in this uh, very prestigious uh, uh, conference. I'd like to discuss about the digital technologies in the public health response to COVID uh, university uh, role in uh, simultaneously with the MPKM program. Uh, yeah, uh, previously, uh, Prof. Ibrahim and Prof. Uh, David uh, tell the role of uh, IT in in uh, student activities in the education. Maybe uh, rather uh, my discussion is uh, more about the role of student in uh, participating in COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Uh, uh, public health responses. So the agenda here is the uh, kind of situation of COVID-19 and then uh, harness of digital technology and role of uh, university, especially in Merdeka Belajar Campus Merdeka or Freedom of Learning and the public health student uh, with experience activities. Uh, this uh, picture shows us the current situation of uh, COVID-19. We know that uh, all parts of uh, the world influenced by this pandemic. And uh, we saw in here in Indonesia, 
and the cases is uh, around 50 until 100 uh, cases per 100,000 population here. And this number actually may be uh, in the actual, in the uh, field may be uh, higher than the number reported. As we know that uh, there are so many uh, other reporting cases, it means that uh, the case, confirmed cases uh, not not being tested by the uh, uh, standard uh, diagnosis of COVID-19. So the underreporting will be uh, misleading in the interpretation of the data. But this is the confirmed cases in Indonesia is around the until 100 uh, cases per uh, 100,000 population. And this uh, figure uh, shows us the uh, number of deaths caused by uh, COVID-19. Yeah. Uh, the higher uh, cases of death, the number of uh, death uh, reflect by the darker area uh, in this, in this uh, picture. Uh, here in Indonesia, uh, we have a uh, case of death is 1.5 until 3 per 100,000 uh, population. This is the uh, recent report. And then uh, this is the uh, number of uh, total infected uh, people around the world. It's around 221 uh, million cases. If we compare with the total population of uh, around the world is uh, 7.8 uh, billion. It means that incident rate of the uh, COVID-19 cases is around 28. Uh, per a thousand population, and the number of death is uh, four point five uh, million. Uh, it uh, compared to the number of uh, cases, the case fatality rate uh, counted as two point zero seven per a hundred cases. Uh, how about the vaccination? The vaccination number is uh, around uh, one point two uh, billion people in the world, uh, it means that uh, the uh, vaccine coverage is uh, around 170 uh, per uh, million population. Uh, we discussed about the herd immunity, and the herd immunity uh, will reach and uh, maybe it's uh, the, our expectation to stop the pandemic. The herd immunity in the measles cases uh, reach uh, after 95% uh, immunity rates in the population. And uh, regarding the polio, uh, it is uh, around 80%. And regarding the COVID-19 is still the question because uh, there are so many uh, variables, there are so many parameters that influence the condition of a herd immunity in COVID-19. Uh, the first issue is uh, about the new variant issues that um, virus um, make a mutation and modify that they are, uh, adapted with the vaccine. So the update and update vaccine should be uh, continuous uh, conducted. And uh, the other uh, issues is right now um, we have 167 per thousand population uh, vaccinated today uh, full full dose is uh, vaccinated today so it's a very very uh, low coverage if we compare with the missiles and uh, polio uh, number in uh, 80 or 95 percent uh, to uh, reach the herd immunity we know that herd immunity will be rich uh, for survivor and also for people who have vaccinated uh, and actually uh, the other uh, issues is uh, regarding to the duration of immunity status. Uh, the study uh, refer that immunity status uh, covered until uh, three months. It's mean that uh, the risk or the probability of uh, infection will be uh, harm to uh, us that it will make, make uh, complicated to reach the heart immunity. Uh, this is the uh, number of uh, testing uh, tested uh, population. Uh, I said before that the number of reported, the real number, actual number reported is depend on the 
uh, people conducted the test. Uh, so many uh, people with symptom and uh, with uh, close contact and uh, mobility may be not being tested. So then, and, and we didn't have uh, this number uh, as well. So it's um, a little bit uh, complicated to know the information regarding the uh, test uh, coverage of the COVID-19. Uh, I think this uh, figure uh, shows us the use uh, of the uh, digital technology in public health response facing pandemic. There's so many uh, uh, technology that may can be used to this uh, this uh, condition. Uh, maybe I will share with this. Yes, uh, uh, the use of uh, digital uh, technology in public health response uh, facing pandemic, uh, COVID-19 pandemic, at least uh, we identify uh, in a minimum of five, uh, five uh, area. Uh, there are digital epidemiological surveillance and then rapid case identification and then interruption of uh, community transmission and uh, public health communication as well as the clinical care. Uh, regarding the uh, digital epidemiological surveillance. Uh, and there are uh, use of this technology uh, to thank them the this activities. Uh, this technology, uh, like uh, machine learning, machine learning, we use to uh, the web-based epidemic intelligence tool and online uh, syndrome uh, syndromic surveillance. Uh, this is in this site uh, the. Example of the use in WHO, uh, we use the uh, EpiBrain and also uh, we use uh, COVID-19 research database that uh, uh, many people uh, include uh, researcher that ask uh, the, the uh, result of uh, artificial intelligence uh, analysis. And then uh, the second is a survey application in websites. Uh, it is uh, frequent to be used in uh, symptom uh, reporting. Uh, we use this uh, condition in uh, in several example. Uh, include in Indonesia, we have a lapor COVID ID at ONG. And then uh, in the aspect of epidemiological surveillance, uh, the digital uh, technology also support the data extraction and uh, visualization. Uh, it's uh, uh, used in the data dashboards, and uh, I think uh, all of us. Also concerned in this this uh, this uh, area, uh, uh, as well as in international in WHO or as in in Indonesia in COVID nineteen dot go dot id. Uh, this is the digital epidemic in surveillance uh, aspect, and then the second thing is uh, the use of digital technology for rapid case identification. Uh, the first area is uh, connecting the uh, diagnostic device. Uh, we often use it as a point of care diagnosis, and we can find the example here, and that support the, that provide the uh, uh, diagnosis uh, tool and uh, instrument that can be accessed uh, by uh, population by uh, individual. And then uh, the second thing is sensor, including the wearables uh, devices. Uh, it include the uh, febrile symptom uh, checking, uh, include the infrared uh, detection of uh, uh, temperature, and this is the the study that that the, this role is very very uh, support the the effort of uh, public health response, and the use of technology of machine learning in the rapid case identification of the use is in medical image analysis. We know that the uh, recent studies uh, regarding the appropriateness and the uh, rapidly of the uh, diagnosis by artificial intelligence, especially in the radiology uh, pattern, uh, the machine is uh, most uh, appropriate and uh, more uh, rapid uh, compared than the human uh, the uh, human, the doctor did.
and it's uh, uh, in the COVID-19, uh, this use in the uh, computer, uh, com computerized tomography, uh, radiography, and to identify the cases of uh, COVID-19. In the third aspect of interruption, uh, community and transmission, the digital technologies play a pivotal role in this area. Uh, smartphone application with low power Bluetooth technology is often used uh, in digital contact tracing. Uh, we use in Indonesia, we know the peduli lindungi that uh, everybody uh, can uh, detect uh, the, the nearest uh, individual with, with COVID-19 uh, that uh, also have uh, the peduli lindungi in his application. And the second aspect is mobile phone location data. Uh, mobility pattern analysis uh, is conducted to, uh, to identify the, the mobility of the uh, people around the world. Uh, we know that the COVID-19 is uh, must be uh, stay at home, but uh, we must uh, make analysis in the uh, mobility of the people. Uh, it's very uh, much uh, data set and analysis uh, provided by in the uh, platform like Google Mobility and other uh, uh, other platforms that uh, provide the mobility data of a uh, person around the world. And also the uh, data set is also provided that uh, we can uh, conduct the research, conduct the study, and uh, make analysis, and then recommend the uh, policymaker. And then uh, public communication also uh, very supported by the digital information, uh, digital uh, technology in the social media platform. Uh, we touched it uh, communication uh, with the uh, proper information from the uh, WHO, from the Ministry of Health and etc. And then uh, online search engine, uh, we conduct the uh, priorities information. We know that the, there is so many information that uh, in the global uh, era and the information is uh, sometimes is true and sometimes is uh, false or uh, it can be an, a hoax. So the, the uh, support by uh, Google search engine also filtering this audition to uh, provide the proper information to the uh, community. And then the chat block uh, technology is uh, we often use to personalize information like in the COVID-19 in the Ministry of Health, in WHO, uh, also as well as in the Lapor COVID IT, etc. And then in uh, clinical care, uh, we use the technology of teleconference uh, to uh, applicate it in the telemedicine and referral system. We know in Indonesia, we know uh, hello doc, hello doctor, and COVID-19 uh, remote assessment in primary care uh, concluded that, that the telemedicine in uh, COVID-19 is also uh, effective to be uh, conducted. Uh, however, uh, some uh, area of the, the uh, identification of or, or recognition of the uh, safer, safer symptom is uh, may uh, be can be improved. Okay. Yes, uh, I think this is uh, uh, same like the previous. The public had uh, respond using of. Uh, uh, digital technology consists of uh, individual data and with this population level data and it's uh, actually this information uh, all of this information is an evident to conduct the public uh, decision uh, policy maker and this uh, figure uh, shows us that uh, the uh, scheme of the application of uh, uh, contact uh, contact uh, uh, of the people to identify the the other people the other individual with the covid-19 yeah with we indonesia uh, use uh, peduli lindungi uh, people with uh, covid-19 if uh, activated the, with the uh, peduli lindungi will be identified and if someone uh, near uh, the system the application will uh, remind the, the uh, user to uh, avoid or to make a, a distance. This is the contact tracing uh, scheme of the use of digital technology and uh, 
uh, until the decision to make a safe uh, quarantine or safe uh, isolation. And uh, this is the result of Google Mobility results of uh, uh, in Indonesia uh, recently. Uh, it's compared in the baseline. Baseline uh, is uh, start uh, before the pandemic uh, begin. It's around in January 2020. So this uh, in yeah retail and recreation at least um, minus four percent. Yeah, and there is so in a uh, significant increase in grocery and pharmacy yeah, in the parking. This is the result of uh, Google Mobility in uh, the use of uh, analysis of of the uh, COVID nineteen pandemic. Uh, this data in the central Java, you know. Uh, Recently, unfortunately, there is an increase of uh, mobility in Central Java uh, population. Yeah, uh, we in Indonesia, uh, our ministry conduct the Merdeka Belajar Campus Merdeka program or Freedom of Learning. So uh, I think this this uh, uh, maybe that I will talk is uh, the experience in public health student, but uh, I think. Uh, since the freedom of learning is uh, give opportunity to the other uh, student to learn maybe the role of, of uh, student in uh, COVID-19 pandemic uh, uh, public health response. Uh, this is uh, the uh, area of uh, activities with experiences, internship, research, social and community project and independent projects, student exchange, uh, teaching existing activities and entrepreneurship. Uh, we have a uh, very uh, important role in the uh, student in uh, facing COVID-19 in the aspect of, uh, especially in health promotion and campaign, as well as the uh, use, uh, utilize of uh, digital technology to strengthen these activities, uh, maybe the promotion of vaccination, promotion of preventive uh, mission, or we often call it as uh, 5M, uh, hand washing with hand sanitizer or uh, uh, soap, wearing face masks, uh, and then physical distancing, uh, social distancing and limit mobility. And then uh, also we must uh, conduct uh, contact tracing. This is a very uh, a good opportunity to our student to make the tracing, yeah, contact tracing. This treaty testing, tracing, and treatment is play a, a pivotal role to uh, limit the COVID pandemic uh, spectrum. And then the research activities, uh, the primary data, secondary data, and tertiary data, as well as in the surveillance, uh, community based uh, surveillance. Uh, also, we can make a profile, uh, surveillance for provided uh, data set uh, provided by Ministry of Health or the Office of uh, Health in the uh, municipality, and then uh, self isolation and quarantine also play a, a pivotal role to limit the uh, spread of the disease. It's uh, especially for confirmed case or close contact or the probable uh, suspect. And uh, yeah, this is uh, our student activities uh, in the make a head promotion or head education to the people to the community in uh, around his or her uh, house in the experience uh, subjects and uh, this is the use of uh, big data or a data set we, we know that in in uh, our method or our design we can conduct the Research uh, by the tertiary data, by the reference or make a thematic review. We conduct it with our student, and uh, it's concerned in recurrence as COVID to uh, RNA positivity. And uh, it's give, uh, I think, good opportunity to our student to learn about the uh, meta analysis and systematic review. And then uh, re uh, we know also conduct the uh, research activities uh, access the research COVID-19 research database in the United States uh, to uh, analyze the recurrent positivity as well of SARS-CoV-2 in the U.S. Uh, setting. Uh, we conduct also with our student uh, 
to provide the conclusion about uh, the, uh, the the possibility of uh, recurrent uh, positivity of uh, SARS COVID two uh, in COVID nineteen. This is the COVID nineteen research database uh, consists of many uh, uh, data sets. The data fund, healthcare post, health jam, yeah, maternal, maternal index, etc. There's so many uh, data that uh, if we have access, if we permitted to access this uh, data, this very uh, big data, include the analytics IQ that uh, it uh, can uh, combine with the artificial intelligence to uh, characterize the determinant of uh, the people uh, who. To, uh, uh, who will uh, in a high risk to infection uh, of COVID-19. Yeah, I think uh, in summary, uh, student and faculty member, uh, not in not only in, in a public health student, uh, play a pivotal role in public health response to the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, especially in the recent activities and health of uh, digital technology. I think uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for the opportunity and uh, if have any patient, don't be uh, hesitant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your very amazing talk, uh, Dr. Azam. And I would agree that public health communication in this critical time heavily relies on data transparency and updates and as they are central in flattening the curve of the pandemic. And Dr. Azam has explained that digital tools such as digital epidemiological surveillance and rapid case identification help to manage the pandemic. Now we have around um, 15 minutes uh, for question and answer session. I know it's not much, but I hope we can cover some of the questions here. Uh, let me look at the chat box. Um, we've got plenty questions actually, but um, Dr. Parsons and Dr. Yete has have actually uh, responded to them. Uh, let me check from the beginning. Uh, Rian Hidayatullah, um, music lecturer, but Dr. Parsons has responded to this, so let's pass this. Um, Okfian. Yeah, I think this is still and responded. So let's take this question uh, to David. Um, so to Dr. Parsons, um, she wants or he wants to know about what is digital transformation in schools and how digitalization is affecting the education system. Oh, it's a very general question. Would you like to respond to that, David? Yes, uh, I did actually try to respond in the in the chat, but I'm more than happy to try and um, and maybe. Uh, speak to that more broadly, because it's a very important question. What what do we mean by you know digitalizing schools? And uh, I, I think it's a reflection, of course, of society. Um, and we've changed society very much over the last few decades in terms of um, digital tools. And uh, education has tended to be a little bit behind because there's always resistance to um, changing education by parents who always think their children should have the same education that they did, uh, even though their children are growing up in a very different world. Um, people who go to work and then work with uh, technology all day sometimes find it strange to suggest that their children should be using technology all day in the classroom. And of course, um, you know, there are good reasons for saying we don't want children to just be using technology all day. I think the important idea around bringing digital tools into the classroom is that they should always be available so that they should be there when they are needed, not that we should be using them for every single activity or everything that we do. So it's a difficult um, thing to get right. But perhaps the first thing to say is that Technology should be available, so students should have access to devices, they should act, have access to the internet, and then it's up to uh, the teacher really to decide um, where and when it's appropriate for that technology to be used by students for their learning. Um, and of course, that's not an easy thing to do for teachers, 
uh, but it's a very important thing that teachers need to be comfortable with and happy to uh, be able to navigate. Yeah, uh, you're right. But on top of that, I actually have one question after discussing with um, some colleagues here. Uh, what are actually the basic competencies teachers need to acquire um, for this transformation that you are proposing? Is it um, coding or language programming? And what are those basic competencies? Uh, that's an excellent question. And I, I would say that it's not really about competencies per se. Uh, I think it's more about a change in perception. Um, there are many, many tools that help students to learn that don't require any particular skills to learn how to use. And in fact, the students can often just learn to use them for themselves. I think the, in, the competency is perhaps understanding what types of tool can support what types of learning. So, you know, when is it useful for students to use, for example, a mind map? When is it useful for students to engage in an online debate? Uh, when is it useful for students to share their ideas in a, in a combined digital space? I think it's those types of questions that teachers need to be able to answer. You know, when to use a particular type of tool in a particular situation to um, help their students learn. Um, thank you, David. I think um, so the basic uh, requirement here is actually analytical and computational thinking, and that relates to our first uh, presenter to um, Ibrahim, Dr. Yete. And here, I think there is one question uh, in the chat box uh, for you. Um, it's from uh, Ganis, um, and it's a question for you. If I'm a teacher in the field of social science, can computational thinking be applied to social science um, and with the condition that theoretical studies and technical studies do not intersect? I don't know what this means, like uh, the example or illustration for this, but I think they still intersect. Yeah, but perhaps you might want to respond to that, uh, Ibrahim. Sure, sure. Thank you for the question. It is excellent. Uh, yes, there are uh, computation thinking, as I mentioned, it's not only for STEM subjects, but also for non-STEM subjects. And specifically, if you look into the uh, social science or music or even dance, you're going to see the applications of the algorithmic approach. You're going to see the application of the squinting, which requires you to have the procedural work to conduct, to, to perform the work. In social science, uh, let's, let's pick up one specific subject. You know, let's say about the, the, the history. Uh, in, in history, what you are going to see is that there are different era that is uh, happened in, in various timeline. So by segmenting this timeline, it's going to enable you to categorize them. So if you look at from the timeline standpoint and what that would be, it will be the composition. So you will decompose the timeline and try to find out what fits to, into which angle of the, let's say that specific era. But as you move forward, you may have some overlapping era as a transitional point. So you may not have a very concrete, you know, set the stone type of like, you know, uh, timeline for that, but segmenting or, or decomposing the timeline would be an example of the, the composition uh, and which fits into the computational thinking competencies. Uh, another example that I can pro perhaps provide more in economy, which we use in our daily life, you see the trends. You see the trends based on, let's say, A country with the B country, there is a conflict. And with the conflict, there is a depletion of the, of the economy, or there is a monetary system change, and you will see the patterns. So decreasing or increasing, you will be able to see that type of like, you know, the change delta and that it also requires us to understand this pattern recognition. You do the patterning to understand that you align with this conflict of the A and B country, uh, and that consequently affects the economy, and that economy results to have different outputs for, for our, our daily life. And what that would be, that could be impacted on our, let's say, you know, uh, uh, monetary units, you know, and that would also, again, allow us to understand the pattern recognition. So yeah, there are so many examples that I can really provide on that, but those are some quick you know, examples. I hope that clarifies. 
Yeah, it's, it's really clear, Ibrahim. And maybe once more, correct me if I'm wrong, like debugging uh, in computer science, uh, maybe in forensic studies, for example, it's like finding the bug. So in forensic, you're finding the bad guy, you know, it's like a bug. <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong. And there is one more question here from Eddie Waluyo. Um, um, because he's um, is actually in early childhood studies and how to implement computational thinking in early childhood because early childhood is still at the stage of concrete thinking. Yeah, I, I, I thought I will not get this question. I'm, I'm, I'm so happy to have this question now. If I may kindly share with you some slides very quickly so that we can make it more tangible for our yes, understanding. Please. All right, those are some of the studies that I conducted back in the US. So if you recall that, we, we call it, there are some, uh, you know, five main pillars of computational thinking. We cannot be able to see all of these computational, you know, thinking competencies or practices. Again, there's still term conflicts over there. We need to really clarify that as we move forward. Uh, but, but here, there are four main pillars of the computational thinking competencies, and those are pattern recognition, abstraction, from the composition, and, and algorithms. And so, one study that we focused on in K2, kindergarten, first grade, and second grade level. So, let me move on to the next slide. You're going to see that from, from this standpoint, we embedded a literacy. You know, we embedded literacy uh, as a driven as a vehicle to really understand how computational thinking may work out. So what we did, we have a book, Joy and Jet. I don't know how many of you may be familiar with that, but this is simply a, a, a book where students they read it through, and as they go through that, they do understand the sequencing, you know, uh, through this, this story. So as, as they read through it, they will see that uh, Joy has a dog, a ball. Uh, a great, uh, and then is throwing the ball with the arm, using the arm, throwing the ball, and uh, Jet has joy. So th that uh, Jet is following the ball, going through different iterative modelings, different angles, and different uh, uh, propositions. Here, to make it more visualized, you're going to see that uh, we are trying to add the propositions for students to really understand right, left, up, on the hill, down the hill. So this directional mode allows that early age students to understand the squeezing. And again, squeezing is a part of computational thinking, which goes into algorithms and procedural work. And with this, with this application of literacy in an earlier age, enables students to have more meaningful understanding of the CT practices. And yes, uh, one interesting part that you mentioned is about, uh, is about the, the, the debugging. They are also able to troubleshoot when their peers make mistakes and they are helping each other about, oh, Jet went first, you know, uh, up on the hill, not down the hill. And, and that correction enables them to have a teamwork, have clear communication. Those are the soft skills along with that they also build to enhance their CT application, CT practices. In a collaborative space. That's really great, Ibrahim. Yeah. Uh, thank you so much. It's really clear. I hope it's clear for um, our questioner. And yes, I, I, I would agree with that, um, that it's about pattern. I remember um, my colleague um, and he's got, I think, a three-year-old son. And his son was arranging like a train with blocks, Lego blocks. And then he asked his daddy, daddy, do you know what I'm making? And then his daddy answered, train? No, it's a pattern. Okay, so that's, that shows a real, uh, you know, it, it, it's concrete, but it's actually an abstraction of that concreteness. Uh, so thank you so much, Ibrahim, for sharing. And maybe uh, one last question uh, for Dr. Azam um, in response to the um, needs of digital tools and digital technology in managing the pandemic uh, with those data synchronization. Uh, maybe you would like to comment um, a little bit about uh, how uh, the public health response and data synchronization that occurs in Indonesia uh, regarding uh, the public health um, um, sector here. Uh, Whether it's um, good or it needs to be improved yeah. or, yes. Thank you. Yeah, uh, it's very uh, hot 
question to be answered. <laughs> yeah, yes. it's a nice uh, question, but yeah, uh, I think uh, the main principle of of uh, uh, data sets, especially in providing information to uh, managing the COVID nineteen pandemic, is uh, it's uh, real data and no redundancy. Uh, so the we are in Indonesia. We have uh, uh, the uh, autonomy, uh, autonomy in, in the province, in the uh, municipality, in the, uh, the district. Uh, it is a little bit uh, effort to make the synchronizing because. Uh, Every every uh, region, every district, every municipality uh, have uh, their own uh, system that uh, it must be uh, compiled uh, with the national sy uh, system. Yeah, I think in the, it is uh, very complicated in the first uh, beginning of uh, COVID nineteen. But uh, right now, I think uh, we adapted. Uh, uh, although we have uh, two system in the. Uh, uh, central system and uh, region system, but uh, I think uh, in recently we can uh, synchronize uh, rapidly. So uh, I think th uh, there is uh, improvement to be conducted, but uh, I think uh, compared to the first beginning of uh, the COVID-19 pandemic, it's uh, better right now. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Dr. Azam. Um, yes, I agree that we are progressing with the Kawal COVID and, and the other platforms. Uh, we are working together, the government and the community sectors, um, to handle this pandemic. And um, hopefully by this collaboration, then uh, the pandemic is, um, um, what is it? It's We can control the pandemic really well. So thank you so much, um, our speakers, uh, Dr. David Parsons, Dr. Ibrahim Yeter, as well as Dr. Mahalul Azam uh, for this very um, insightful and inspiring uh, discussion. And also thank you very much uh, to our um, audience uh, for the questions. So we have this very vibrant discussion. And for the last thing, uh, before we go into the second plenary session, we're going to have a token of appreciation center and it's going to be handled by the master of ceremony. So I give the time back to our master of ceremony, Grinda. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you very much, Ibu Zulfa, our moderator, and also all speakers. And as mentioned by the moderator, we would like to give you virtual token of appreciation. The first is for Assistant Professor Ibrahim Yatta from Nanyang Technological University, Singapore. Please accept our token of appreciation. <laughs> Thank you very much once again, Assistant Professor Ibrahim Yatra from Singapore. We hope to have another opportunity with you in another occasion. The Thank second, you. yes, there you go. The second one is for Mr. Jeffrey Persons, PhD from the Mind Life by Unitech, New Zealand. Please accept our token of appreciation. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you very much uh, for being with us right now. And the third one is for Associate Professor Mahalul Azam, PhD from Universitas Negeri Semarang. Sir, please accept our token of appreciation.
Thank you. Thank you, Bazam, and we hope this can uh, change uh, what's so called our opportunity to meet in person. And thank you very much once again for your contributions to this conference. And uh, we will proceed to the second plenary sessions with the honorable speakers, Assistant Professor Bob Feng Shua Sung from the Education University of Hong Kong, Hong Kong. And then Professor Dr. Nur Zaidi Haji Mohamed Daud from University Technology Mara, Malaysia. And also uh, for Professor uh, Dr. Aris Junaidi from the Director of Learning Student Affairs of the Directorate General of Higher Education's Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology. So to lead this second plenary session, we will have our moderator, Ibu Intan Permata Hapsari, SPD and PD, our head of international office. So please, Ibu Intan, the moderator, the time is yours. Thank you for the Master of Ceremony, uh, Kirindra Putri. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Intan, and I'll be the moderator for this second plenary session. Thank you for joining this session. Ladies and gentlemen, for the first speaker of plenary session two, we would have uh, Associate Professor Bob Feng Su, uh, sorry, Bob Feng Su Sun, PhD from the Education University of Hong Kong. Before that, let me read his short biography. Okay. Dr. Bob Feng Su Sun is the assistant professor and associate head in health and physical education, the Education University of Hong Kong. He holds a PhD in sports science and physical education since 2011. Currently, his main researches are nutritional metabolical aspect of exercise, exercise, nutrition and body weight control, physical activity, also nutrition and health promotion. Bob Feng Shusun was nominated visiting prof, uh, scholarship by Nottingham Trent University United Kingdom on February 2018. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to invite Associate Professor Bob Feng Sosun, PhD, who is going to present his 20 minutes paper entitled Fluid Intake and or Brief Mindfulness-Based Intervention, Possible Strategies on Improving Cognitive Function of College Soccer Players. Professor Bob Feng Sosun, time is yours. Okay, uh, thank you for your kind introduction. Now I would like to share my screen firstly. Okay, yeah, please do. Mm, for a moment. So, uh, so can you, can you see my screen now? Yes, that's it. Okay. okay, thank you very much. Uh, so good morning, everyone, or maybe good uh, afternoon for some audience. Uh, it's my pleasure and honor to have this opportunity to present uh, my study. Uh, so uh, actually, uh, so the topic of my presentation is a fluid intake and a brief mindfulness-based intervention, uh, possible strategies on improve, uh, improving cognitive function of college soccer players. Uh, as introduced, my name is Bob, uh, coming from Department of Health and Physical Education, uh, Education University of Hong Kong. 
Uh, so because of time, I may not introduce very detail about my study. However, I would like to highlight some, some of uh, very important information in my research. Uh, so here is the outline of my uh, presentation today. So uh, after introducing background and literature, I would like to highlight the two recently uh, uh, completed studies by our research group. Uh, okay. Uh, so we all know that uh, soccer is a very popular and quite demanding exercise, both uh, physiologically and uh, psychologically. Uh, so uh, physio uh, from physiological perspective, uh, soccer includes uh, both aerobic and uh, anaerobic exercise or activities. Uh, for a psychological perspective, uh, because soccer players will need to observe their situations on their fields, predict their positions of their uh, ball and their other players, as well as change their positions and uh, directions or speed very frequently. So it's quite easy for soccer players to get fatigue. Uh, such kind of fatigue actually will be both uh, physiologically and uh, uh, mental fatigue. Uh, actually, when getting fatigue, the uh, soccer players may feel tight. Okay, may feel tight, uh, lack of energy, and reduce muscle force. So the fatigue actually can be uh, can be occurred at any time of the soccer competition, especially at the second half. Uh, recent research has suggested that the fatigue can be happen at the initial phase of the second half. Uh, okay, including the decrease of performance and the decrease of cognition or cognitive function. Uh, for example. Previous research found that the distance covered at high speed have been shown to be reduced in the first 15 minutes of the second half when compared with the corresponding period of the first half. Uh, for the cognition, uh, research also found that the increase in response accuracy observed during the first 30 minutes of intermittent exercise in the first half was attenuated in the first 15 minutes of the second half. Okay, uh, for the physiological uh, fatigue or physiological change occurred in the uh, soccer competitions, actually previous research have investigated uh, a lot for this uh, problem. So uh, actually we can see that up during the competitions, the, we can uh, see the intake uh, uh, increase of blood lactates, which will achieve the highest points after the intense exercise. So such kind of a high blood lactate concentration actually can uh, affect the sprint performance uh, negatively. Also, it is easy to observe the uh, changes in blood glucose and the muscle glycogen. So the blood glucose concentration will decrease and there will be muscle glycogen depletion uh, after soccer. So this will definitely negatively affect the energy uh, usage, uh, decision making, skill performance, risk of injury or muscle fiber twitch, so on and so forth. Uh, also, muscle damage can happen during uh, soccer competition. This will uh, increase muscle pain and the blood creating kinase con concentrations uh, so as to decrease the muscle force. Uh, another thing is the changes in uh, cortisol level. So actually uh, we can observe the increased cortisol during the competition. Uh, this will negatively affect the cognition and some uh, anxiety. Uh, all in all, all these physiological changes or physiological fatigue will affect the performance during the competition. Uh, for the mental fatigue or psychological fatigue, actually, it is also very common. Uh, uh, you know, uh, the demanding uh, in cognitive function actually may cause the mental fatigue. So we can see that uh, in one side, mental fatigue increase will uh, increase the perception of efforts so, uh, so as to decrease the endurance performance. Also, mental fatigue will definitely impair their cognitive function, uh, including their response time, accuracy, attention, 
uh, action uh, plan preparation performance monitoring or performance adjustment. So this will uh, you know, be approved by some uh, uh, cognitive function test. We can see that the tactical performance will decrease, decision-making skills will decrease, and skill performance will decrease. And also, all these negative uh, results of their mental fatigue will definitely affect their performance during their competition. So it will be very interesting now to whether there are some strategies will be helpful to delay their physiological fatigue and the mental fatigue during soccer. Uh, we all know that the whole soccer game actually consists of a two uh, 45 minutes uh, halves uh, with a 15 minutes halftime break. Uh, actually, uh, now uh, recent research has uh, proved that the 15 minutes halftime break actually is the key point to employ some recovery strategies to delay the uh, physiological or psycho uh, psychological mental fatigue. Uh, so as to improve or maintain their exercise capacity during the second half. Uh, according to this model by uh, Russia uh, in 2015, uh, there are many different kinds of intervention strategies that may be used during the 15 minutes break to help to delay their fatigue. Uh, for example, uh, there will be some uh, uh, passive heat maintenance strategies, or maybe some uh, massage, or maybe some other uh, warm up uh, activities. Uh, actually, uh, at the bottom of this model, actually, you can see that uh, it is strongly encouraged to optimize the hydration and the nutritional practice. For example, you should need to consume some sports drinks to maintain your hydration status or maybe to uh, provide some energy. Uh, uh, for the nutritional strategies, actually, uh, like what I have introduced, the carbohydrate electrolyte drink has been uh, commonly recommended and suggested. Uh, so, uh, we all know that carbohydrate ingestion or consumption can provide energy for not only the skeletal muscle, but also the central nervous system, because carbohydrate is also the key energy source for our central nervous system. Uh, therefore, carbohydrate ingestion will be helpful for both physiological and psychological functions. It will, uh, it will also be helpful for the cardiovascular system functions. So the interactive effect of these factors actually will affect the blood glucose and the muscle glycogen. Uh, so maybe helpful for the maintenance of uh, uh, glucose and the glycogen. So as to helpful for the decision-making uh, skill performance, uh, be helpful to reduce the risk of injury as well as be helpful for the muscle fiber twitch. So this has been showed in uh, many previous research. Uh, however, for the psychological strategies during the 15 minutes break, there are actually not many studies have focused or interested in this part, especially uh, talking about the mindfulness. Uh, so uh, the definition of mindfulness is that the awareness that emerged through playing attention uh, paying attention on purpose and non-judgmentally to the unfolding of experience moment by moment. There are three key characteristics uh, regarding the mindfulness. One is uh, flexible, uh, actually can do mindfulness at any time, anywhere, uh, non-defensive. Actually, the purpose of the mindfulness is not to uh, change your emotion or current awareness. Uh, for example, if you feel nervous now, actually mindfulness does not mean to change or uh, improve your uh, nervous, it's just uh, let you to accept the current situations. Uh, also, uh, it's a present focus awareness, focus on the current, not the past, not the future. Uh, okay, 
Uh, actually, mindfulness based intervention, we use abbreviation MBI, have been widely used in previous research, but not in many in the uh, uh, soccer. Uh, according to this slides, you can see that uh, previous research has clearly shown that uh, mindfulness uh, based intervention or MBI has an accurate effect on both physiological response and psychological response. Uh, for the physiological response, actually, it includes, uh, includes the, uh, it can increase the pain tolerance, so maybe helpful for decrease the muscle pain. Uh, will uh, be helpful for decreased heart rate, blood pressure, so as to be helpful for the cardiovascular system recovery, uh, also be helpful for the uh, skin responses, uh, so, uh, so can relax uh, more. For psychological perspective, it will be helpful to decrease the mental fatigue and increase the cognitive function. Uh, so it will be helpful for the uh, endurance performance, decision making, skill performance, so on and so forth. It should be noted that uh, most of the research uh, regarding MBI actually has, a focus, has been conducted in the resting status and uh, among some non athletes population. So it is possible that the mindfulness in the uh, half-time break in soccer may be helpful for their soccer performance, especially for their second half. However, this question actually has been uh, not uh, clearly in, uh, investigated before. Uh, so uh, the, for our uh, first study, the research gap is that uh, carbohydrates intake is commonly adopted strategy during their half-time in soccer. However, relatively less attention has been patient to the potential beneficial effect of MBI on the recovery, especially for psychological status. Uh, the aim of our first study was to investigate the accurate effect of MBI plus carbohydrate intake on soccer players' sprint performance and cognition during halftime break. The hypothesis is that the combined strategy uh, uh, i.e. carbohydrate plus MBI maybe have better effects on sprint performance and the cognitive function. Uh, so I will introduce the methodology of uh, uh, this study. We recruited uh, 14 male soccer players. Uh, so the will to max was around uh, 70, uh, 47 uh, uh, ML per kilogram per minute, no mindfulness related history. Uh, the research design is a crossover study design. All participants completed uh, uh, one pre trial and three uh, main trials. Three main trials include one control trial, one carbohydrate trial, and one carbohydrate plus mindfulness trial. So the washout period uh, or break between any two. Trial, two main trials was uh, more than uh, 72 hours. Uh, from this uh, table, we can see the difference between these uh, three groups. Uh, for the control group or placebo group, actually they consumed some electrolyte solution without carbohydrate. Uh, for the carbohydrate trial, so we added carbohydrate in the electrolyte solution, uh, carbohydrate and mindfulness trial, uh, we include carbohydrates. And for the another part, for the control trial, uh, we used 60 minutes traveling introduced audio. It should be a neutral uh, introduction audio. Uh, in carbohydrate trial, also neutral audio. Uh, but in the carbohydrate M trial, uh, participants will need to complete it, uh, 60 minutes mindfulness based intervention. Uh, so this is the difference between this among these three trials or three groups. Uh, this slide shows the research protocol. Uh, so for the pre-trial, uh, they, they were completed three days before the main trial. Uh, uh, participants needed to complete the multi-state fitness test to estimate their will to max. Uh, some demographic information like body height, weight, should be measured. 
and the participants need to get familiar with their procedures in their matrix. Uh, for the matrix, we use the protocol adopted adapted from the list, i.e. Lafber intermittent shuttle test. I think for the soccer players, they should be very familiar with this protocol. Uh, uh, in brief, this protocol actually includes three sessions with uh, uh, 15 minutes uh, per session. Uh, so there, in each session, there were several blocks for each block include some walk sprints, active recovery, or running at a different uh, percentage of will to max. Uh, also, uh, uh, we add some strip test during the third, uh, three minutes rest to continue, uh, consume athletes cognitive function. Uh, the measurements, the primary outcomes of our study is uh, includes uh, 20 minutes uh, sprint performance. Uh, so you can see that for the pre-test, uh, there will be one test, and for the post-test, there will be six uh, repeated uh, sprint performance. Uh, we also measured the vertical jump, use jump to uh, APP. Uh, also uh, measured the uh, soccer player's cognitive function pre and post, uh, including stroop test, a uh, cost block typing test and the rapid vision information processing task uh, using computer. Uh, some secondary outcome measures, uh, for example, mindfulness states, uh, mental fatigue, and uh, as well as some physiological perspective, including muscle pain, uh, exercise intensity, blood glucose and blood lactate, as well as uh, heart rates. Uh, here, I would like to highlight some uh, key findings of our study. Uh, this uh, slide shows the sprint performance. So actually, if, uh, there will be some interactive effect and the treatment effect among three trials. Uh, Post-hoc testing shows that carbohydrate M trial or carbohydrate mindfulness trial will better than carbohydrate trial better than control trial. However, no difference between the carbohydrate trial and control trial. Uh, for the cognitive function, we found the uh, difference in response time, reaction time uh, for COSI uh, block test, but not the other two tests. Uh, for this test, actually, uh, we can see that the carbohydrate M trial also pre, pre uh, versus post uh, uh, there will be significant difference. You can see this in this trial, the uh, response time has improved in carbohydrate M trial. Uh, for their mental fatigue, it's quite clearly that their mental fatigue in carbohydrate M trial has decreased significantly from their pretest. Okay, also uh, better than the other two trials. The mindfulness states, so it shows clearly that mindfulness has a, sorry, uh, there are some problems in my, in my slides. I will uh, open it again. Uh, wait for a moment. Yes, uh, I hope you can see my uh, screen. Uh, sorry for the technical problem. So we can see that carbohydrate M trial shows the better states of mindfulness level. Okay, this uh, uh, table is a summary of uh, previous results. Actually, we can see some uh, uh, positive effects in carbohydrate M trial, including the state of mindfulness level. Uh, state of mindfulness, uh, mindfulness level uh, better for mental fatigue. 
better for the sp uh, repeated sprint performance and uh, better for the uh, cause a uh, block taping test cognitive function. Uh. So MBI could significantly increase the athlete's mindfulness level according to our initial results. It may benefit the repeated sprint activity, but not single measures. For example, vertical jump. Uh, also, uh, our results show that uh, mindfulness-based intervention has a certain beneficial effect on soccer players' cognitive function performance and uh, will better uh, the re uh, benefit the recovery of soccer players' uh, mental fatigue. So, uh, so this, the significance of this study is that uh, on top of traditional psychological interventions, for example, yeah, self- Excuse me. Uh, Self-talk, uh, imaginary, so on and so forth. The present study firstly explored applying MBI as a potential recovery tool in half-time break. Uh, preliminary uh, identified the acute and positive effect of MBI on mental fatigue, repeated sprint performance, and the reaction time uh, on uh, cognitive function. Uh, actually, uh, in conclusion, we uh, first study provide a prelim preliminary evidence for the positive effect of a brief MBI coupled with carbohydrate intake on athletes' cognitive function and athletes' recovery from fatigue after their halftime break. Uh, so actually, this uh, uh, the finding of this uh, stu uh, this study have been published uh, last year in two. Uh, international papers. If you have interest and would like to know more uh, detail about this, uh, this, this study, you can check for these uh, two uh, papers. Okay, uh, because of time, I will not introduce in detail about the second study, but uh, would like to highlight some important uh, information. Uh, so the rationale of our follow-up study is that also, carbohydrate ingestion is a convenient strategy during the halftime break. The unique effect of MBI on its performance and cognitive function should be explored. Because if you remember, in our first study, we found that carbohydrate mindfulness trial may be better. However, it combined the effect of carbohydrate and mindfulness. So in the second study, we would like to use mindfulness only. So considering the significant, but not a very sensitive outcome of cognitive function, some neuroscientific instruments should be employed by future study to investigate their potential mechanisms. Uh, okay, so uh, the second study aimed to investigate the accurate effect of brave mindfulness on soccer players' cognitive performance after their halftime. Uh, we hypothesis that a brief mindfulness solely could provide some acute beneficial effect on cognition during their half time. Okay, so because of time, I will skip several slices. Uh, this is a research design. So uh, it's a single blended uh, crossover uh, study design. Participants completed one pre-trial and two main trials, uh, i.e. Uh, mindfulness trial and control trial, similar to the first study, uh, the washout period is more than uh, 72 hours. So this protocol actually was conducted in the laboratory because it is more accurate. Uh, similarly, for the control trial, participants only listen a uh, travel audio uh, in uh, 15 minutes half a break, and the MBI trial, they will do some mindfulness-based intervention, including mindful breathing and the body scan. So the primary outcome includes the uh, cognitive function. Uh, we use strobe test and the cost block test to measure the inhibition and working memory this time. Also, uh, the participants was monitored by functional near infrared spectroscopy, uh, FNIRS. Uh, which is a relatively new technology to monitor the hemodynamic response of our uh, brain, uh, including the, uh, the oxygen hemoglobin and the deoxygen hemoglobin. Uh, we also include some secondary outcomes, 
uh, for example, state of mindfulness, salivary cortisol level, heart rates, blood lactates, mental fatigue, and muscle pain. Okay, uh, for the uh, results, I would like to only highlight the uh, key results. Actually, we found that MBI, MBI uh, uh, group actually showed better performance uh, in these two tests in both reaction time and accuracy. Uh, okay, this is a key result. We also found some difference uh, about the FNS data. Uh, so, so because of time, actually, we do not uh, uh, want to introduce this intel. Uh, I will also, also would like to skip several slides for the secondary outcomes. Maybe we uh, move to the summary of the key findings. So in this uh, second study, uh, we found that brief MBI during a simulated half-time break may potentially, be, um, potentially benefit SLS working memory in terms of uh, both reaction time and accuracy. However, the FNS results only partially support the activation of certain prefrontal bridging errors. Uh, we also found that the concentration of salivary cortisol level and the mental fatigue level decreased after the MBI compared with those in the control group. Mm. Okay, so uh, two limitations. One is that we uh, did not recruit the female athletes. Uh, those may limit the generalization of the results. Also, we used one lab-based experiment, which, which may differ from the uh, set of the actual competition situations. Uh, in conclusion, uh, in second study, the accurate effect of MBI on athletes' mental fatigue and cortisone concentration was detected, and their beneficial effect on cognition was uh, preliminarily uh, supported. Uh, so uh, this, uh, the finding of this uh, study actually is uh, still under review. We hope that it could be published uh, very soon so you can get more detailed about our uh, second study. Uh, so uh, at the end, I would like to uh, thank the uh, UNES for their invitation and support for my presentation. I would like to thank my group members, collaborators, as well as, well as ground support from our university. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, that's my, all my presentation. If you have any further questions or comments, uh, I'm happy to have some further discussion with you in Q&A session. So this slide also shows my email. If you have any further questions, please feel free to contact me. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Bob, for your fruitful presentation. Yeah, uh, Bob here is highlighting that the potential effect of uh, fluid intake and or brief mindfulness intervention on cognitive function of college soccer players. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, for the second speaker of plenary session two, we would have Professor Dr. Nurzaidi Haji Muhammad Daud from University Technology Mara, Malaysia. I will read his short biography first. Professor Dr. Nurzaidi Haji Muhammad Daud is a professor in the Faculty of Business and Management at University Technology. Mara, Malaysia. Professor Dr. Nurzaidi Mahmud Daud has been awarded the Darjah Johan Negeri Order if the Defender of State member by His Excellency Tun Datuk Sri Utama Haji Abdul Rahman bin Haji Abbas Penang in 2020. He holds a PhD in Management Information Systems from Multimedia University, Malaysia. He is the Board of Trustees in Foundation of Innovation, Malaysia, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation, appointed by 
Kairi Jamaluddin, Minister of Science, Technology, and Innovation, Malaysia, on June 2020 until June 2022. Scopus reports in August 2021 that Norzaidi's work has been cited by 410 times. Yeah, okay. All right, in this session, Professor Dr. Norzaidi Hadi Mohdaud is going to present his 20 minutes paper entitled 7K Knowledge for a New Norm Researcher. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Dr. Norzaidi Haji Muhammad Daud from University Technology Mara, Malaysia. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. And very good morning to all of you. Thank you very much, especially to respective uh, chairpersons, uh, Dr. Intan Permata, uh, Pak Rector, uh, and Pak Rector and Lulu Farida uh, is uh, are actually my uh, counterpart for research activities now that we have a matching grant. And inshallah, we'll complete it in next year, okay? And um, now also uh, take the opportunity to say to our friends in the business school that uh, they're giving me the opportunity to share and give a class on research methodology in the, on every Tuesday. Thank you very much, okay? And uh, I will share my slide with you. And um, hopefully that you can see my slide. Yes, that's a clear. Okay. The topic that I want to discuss today is very simple and very easy. And I understand that everybody on every university right now, we are catching up to the standards of international global standards. They are we looking for the quality of uh, QS standard or a THE standard. And that's why today I will discuss a little bit on it. Okay. Uh, we heard about pandemics, uh, COVID 19, okay and how actually we deal with them, especially for those who are not doing research, okay? And I uh, just want to share with you um, good news uh, that we had last two days uh, from uh, Ministry of Education in Malaysia that uh, our university, University of Dimara, have been granted uh, 220 million ringgit for 206 projects. So this is the start as a, you know, for me, in order to start with the research activities, definitely we need to, Yes, apply for the research grant. So in order to uh, make us uh, active in research, definitely we need to start with what? With the fund, okay? So, um, sorry, I need to... This one. Okay, this is uh, my brief uh, profile. Huh? And um, my area of study definitely in human mission interactions. And uh, most likely I would say that uh, I also prone to study in maritime industries. And uh, yeah, presented uh, findings of research in Harvard and Cambridge. And um, definitely, yes, I'm quite active in the invention and innovation competitions. And uh, probably I will share a little bit. Okay, now, how to make us good researcher? Okay, so as a university, we want to find someone that very good. So in order to what? Yes, to increase the visibility of the image of the industries itself. So now one, one thing is that we need to publish in good journal. So that's why right now all of us here, even the students itself, need to plan okay, and try to come up with the good materials good findings and publish in high impact journal, okay? What's so important about this? Because if we can publish in high impact journal, the tendency that people or other researchers to cite our works is very high. So that's the thing. That's the first achievement. If let's say that as a researcher, we can get published in high impact journal. That's number one. And number two is that if our work be cited by guru in that discipline, especially for the world recognized gurus. So if we can do that, that's another milestone, okay? It's not enough just to get published in high impact journal, 
but if the guru is out, okay, cited our works and it showed the recognitions and definitely it will boost up the visibility of you as a researcher as well as the universities. Okay, another thing is that, yeah, definitely our works is cited by the gurus. And then what's next? Cited by the high impact journal. Okay, and definitely what I want to say is that, is it enough to publish? Not enough. Cited by guru, another recognition. And then what's next? Yes, cited by the high impact journal. So what's that mean? Means that your works have been recognized. And then I would say that will be referenced to all the people, in the world, especially in your area. Okay. And what's next? Is it enough? Incited by high impact journal, by gurus, published in high impact journal, not enough. Applied by the industry. So that's why right now, all of us, we need to think as a good researcher, we need to think that every single material that we publish in good journal will be applied by the industry. That's been done right now. Seriously, I would say that, especially in the medical of this industry, definitely. All the doctors will read the articles. And then why we do that? Because they want to see, to improve, to solve the problems. And then probably I would say that it will improve the quality of life. So that's the things. So that's why right now, when we do the articles, it must be something that I would say worthy. And then it's not just enough for the academics purpose, but for the industry, yes, I would say needs. And also don't forget about community. When we want to get published, we publish our articles, we publish our findings, definitely community will also get benefits. Okay, how is that being done? Seriously, this community, we use our model, we use our formula, we use our whatever we introduce to them and definitely they will use that in order to solve the current problem or the previous problem they can handle. So that's the achievement to the researcher. That's, I would, I would call that as an inputful uh, uh, fruitful findings from the research and then benefiting to the community. So what's next? It's not enough for the industry. It's not enough for community. Definitely when your model, your formula, whatever that you introduce, especially for the service products that you introduce, definitely will actually aware by the pemerintah, by the government policy maker. Because you know what? Every single thing that we have right now, like now, we are facing pandemic, COVID-19. Everybody actually busy with the works with the pandemic, work from home, uh, study online, okay? And then a lot of things have been faced. So that's why our government need to have some sort of the, we call the solutions. And then these solutions not just directly uh, being introduced. It must be studied. And then we are as a, uh, researcher, we are responsible to do, and our goal is to come up with a good formula or model or anything that be used by the pemerintah or policymaker to make it done. Okay, so that's the things. Also, what's that? Other than these of these, uh, we call the characteristics. Definitely, as a good researcher, we are also the source of information. Anyone will come to us and ask a lot of questions. See, I can see that from here. Okay, from the chat box, everybody ask the question. That's a good, we call that, you know what, interactive communication means that if someone need to have sort of information, so you are the source of information that can give, I would say the solution probably, and then you know what can be dispersed to other societies. So that's the thing. And also as a good researcher, it's enough just publishing papers, not enough decided by the gurus. Not enough by started by high impact journal, but you are also the inventor. Inventor means what? You start doing something that not been think by others. You are the first person that think with, you know what, to uh, come up with a good materials, model, whatever. And then lastly, can help to the community and also to the uh, society and also to the industry. What to say is that right now in the new norm, as an inventor, you also need to think that how you can improve return on investment for a monetary incentive. And also, at the same time, we also can improve quality of life. Okay? Inventor, how about the, the, the difference between inventor and innovator? Inventor means that you start from zero and then you invent something. However, innovator, you already probably have some sort of the model models studied by 
previous researcher, but you are the person who improvise it, you enhance it. So now, okay, I will say that, okay, as an inventor, you can introduce something that I will say novel, and also as an innovator, also you probably something that new and also impactful to the society, community, as well as a policy maker. Other than that, please write a book. A good researcher need to write a book because you know what? Your thought will be kept there because you know why? If you love, no one will actually can introduce that. So you are the person can write something that very important that people will actually look, take a look and then use that as the practice. And then what's next? I just give examples. Okay, this is a, a few of my articles that publish in a few a few uh, journals. And then uh, these articles have been cited by gurus. And then it's some sort of recognition. Okay, I feel that you know what something that wow, when the gurus, especially in my area like Delon and McLean, cited our words. So means what? Means that they recognize our research. And then from there, it give a motivation to us to publish more and more and more. Okay, and then you can see that from the list, definitely when you when the uh, the, the gurus of the areas of our studies uh, cited our works, you see other journals will cited it. And alhamdulillah, you see uh, it will actually grow the confidence, and then you will uh, I will say that contribute more. And as I mentioned it before, as a good researcher, it's not just enough to get published, cited, but you need to contribute to the society. I've been uh, contacted by Martin White from UK. And this guy wrote to me that uh, my model that I introduced in this article actually helped him to solve the current problem, especially in the intranet evolution in UK, okay? So what we can see is that sometimes our writing is something for you is not really for you is not really good, but outside there people love to have it. Okay, so how to start with this? We call that kind of material that uh, industry will love to uh, use it. First thing is that every single title, every single issue, every single problem that we introduce definitely not just enough to read one from the articles. So what I need to do, to do is that, okay, instead of doing that academically, what we can do is go to the field, go to the field, find out the, 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 the actual issue, find out the actual, uh, the actual problem. Then from there, you will actually get something that very interesting. And then finally, you can come up with a fruitful output, outcome and impact. So that's the things, okay? So we need to think about it as a university, we want to definitely visualize the image of the university, visualize of the researcher, okay? Also the student, as a postgraduate student, also you can publish a lot, okay? Your PhD is a masterpiece. From there, you can introduce something that people don't know and you are the person that probably can solve that kind of problem that you face for so long, okay? Want to say is that right now, it's not just enough to get published academically, but we need to really involve the society, the community, the, the industry, and also the policy maker to take up materials from our articles, okay? And then what's next? Yes, when you write uh, the books, book must be also impactful. So this is one example that I wrote this book while I'm studying PhD, okay? I'm so lucky that, you know what? This book really have been, you know, yes, and then, you know, I've been placed at MIT, Yale, and also in Library of Congress, uh, the largest uh, library in the world. And you see that what is so special about Library of Congress? Yes, the, 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 the movie of National Treasure, okay? By Nicolas Cage, okay? It's, it's about the Library of Congress, okay? So um, this is the things that we, we should do. Okay, uh, this is the examples of, uh, okay? And then what's next? So this is the, the, the topics that I want to discuss. Uh, as to become a good researcher, okay, especially the students self. So the students need to know seven knowledge. Okay, when come to this, 
especially when come to the Baba Boss exam, when come to the defense of research proposal, our students struggle to deal with this. The first question that examiner will ask definitely, number one, what is your discipline? And they don't really know what is the meaning of discipline. The, the, the research interest probably I would say. It. And there are actually so many answers. So what I want to say is that when we cannot recognize discipline of our research, definitely we cannot move the next steps. What's the next step to recognize issue and problem? So what I want to say is that in order our study have been recognized, been accepted in uh, good journals, Okay, so what I want to say is that we must be precise on what discipline that we want to look. Okay, for instance, discipline can be in management, in engineering, more precise, a bit probably strategic management, probably in uh, electrical engineering, some sort like that. So that's what we call it as a discipline. And then easier to us to do the literature review because if they say that we not really understand or define the meaning of discipline of our research, that's why we are struggling to go forward. Okay, what's next? The research. Yes, many of us still struggling to understand type of research, especially in viva boss exam. Oh, you ask you, the students especially, what is type of your research? And many of them we answer like this: qualitative, quantitative, qualitative, quantitative, triangulation. Sorry, my friend, that's not the answer. Okay, that's type of methodology. So what's the, the type of research? Okay, I'll explain it later. And then what's next? As a student, as a researcher, we need to know their methodology. If our process to get the data is not being recognized, then it's doubtful, okay? So that's why we need to know about the methodology. And then what's next? After we have the data, you need to know how to analyze it and interpret it, okay? So this is very important. Many of us can analyze, but the problem is that to interpret, what is the meaning of beta of 40 compared of beta of 0 0.2? Huh? Same as what is the standard deviation of 30 and negative, let's say one, what's that? So these are the things that we need to learn, okay? And then afterwards, communications is very important, okay? We need to know okay, how to communicate to the respondent, how to communicate with the supervisors, how to communicate with the, yeah, in the conference. So that's the things. And then later, writings. Okay, writing is something that uh, everybody can write, but you must understand the purpose. In order to write the articles, in order to write the report to the boss, in order to write the thesis, a little bit different. But the last, 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 uh, last but not least, definitely logic. Logic is uh, very important because I you know why I have actually faced so many, uh, I would say that uh, problem with the student when they are actually uh, try to uh, uh, do solution on some, some, something, but they forget about logic. Okay, I will give you an example later. Okay, so these are the things about discipline. So how to recognize? The thing is that after we know the area of interest, okay, after I understand the area of interest, then we can actually come up with the issue and problem. So this is how actually we can recognize our discipline. What is the issue? So what's the problems? What the gap of knowledge? But the thing is that many of us still struggle to understand the differences between issue and problem. They, they thought that issue is the problem. No, issue is not the problem, okay? So issue is the subject matter, the topic that we discuss. And then afterward, the issue we contribute to the problem. And then we cannot start the research with the problem, cannot. Problem is the negative statement. So issue is the must. So that's why in order to start the research, not enough just reading the article to get the ideas is okay, but we need to go to the field, find the exact issue, find the exact problem. Why? Because what we get from the articles is only the summary. Huh? that been done in other countries. For so let's say that are now in Indonesia. We are now in Indonesia. We want to collect data in Indonesia. And most of the article not from Indonesia, I would say. Okay, same as in Malaysia. That's why I, I, I told my students, in order to you know, get as an issue and problems, you need to go to the field. Not enough just to read an articles. Okay, you may have read so many articles, but the thing is that, is it really happened in our soil? 
Okay, so is it the issue there? Is it the problem is there? So what I'm to say is that, yes, go to the field, do preliminary studies, then what's next? You will ensure everything there. The issue as an issue, as a problem, then you know what? Yes, it can flourish your discipline. Okay, and then what's next? Definitely, you need to come up with the novelty. Every research that we do right now, is it a normal research or impactful research? Especially you want to say about PhD, definitely is about impactful. Okay, it's a novel. Okay, to compare between normal research and PhD research, or impactful research is about gap of knowledge. So when people talk about no, uh, gap of knowledge, most likely people will say that, oh, not, not many studies have been done in that area. Yes, that's part, part of the reasoning. However, the best reasoning is that is so many inconsistency of the previous funding. Because of that reason, definitely we want to fill in that gap and then find out the solution. Okay, so but that's about. And then how about research? Okay, when we call and discuss about type of research, definitely people will confuse between type of research or type of methodology. As I mentioned it before, people love to talk about qualitative, quantitative, or triangulation, okay? And then uh, when come to especially the Bible of the exam, the student will love to use uh, our applied triangulation. And then when we ask back, why you, uh, why you use a, a triangulation? Why you apply triangulation? The answer is very simple. Or oh, qualitative is not enough. Quali quantitative will fit in, okay? Make everything fixed. Well, that's not the answer, my friend. So that's why, in order to understand this, definitely, we need to know what is type of research, okay? Normally, normally, especially in Malaysia, uh, there, there are three types of research, especially basic research or fundamental, applied research, transnational or disruptive. But today, I will not discuss on transnational or disruptive because we don't have enough time. 20 minutes, it's not, it's too short. So that, that's why, we discuss a little bit on what is basic research, okay? So what I want to say is that here, when we talk about basic research, definitely the nature of that research, objective of that research definitely is to discover, is discovering, okay? When we are discussing on discovering, modeling, formulating, characterizing, describing, exploring, then it's suit for basic research, okay? So if someone asks you in Bible Boss exam or probably the reviewer asks you about your article, why are you actually prone on basic research? Because you are doing this, the nature of the research, doing on discovering, modeling, formulating. So that's the answer. And how about applied research? Definitely so different. You compare with basic, you compare with applied, definitely so different, okay? And they are, they, that's why many of our students, when they ask back, Okay, they, they say that, oh, my, stu my study is a fundamental, but we, when we take a look at the objective and the title itself, definitely so different. It's about applied research. So now you see, the nature of applied research definitely is about what? Relationship, association, standing, improving, impact, influence, determining, investigating, validating, blah and blah. There's so many things others you can actually add in, okay? And what to say is that when we talk about basic research, it's absolutely new, totally new. It's invention. So that's why in order to distinguish between invention, innovation, definitely from this, invention is about zero to something. You, do, you don't see it before, and then you come up with something. However, when you discuss about innovation, you already have the model, you already have the products, you have the technique, and then you will improvise it. So that's so different, okay? When the nature of your research is concerning on discovering blah and blah, that's basic research. Again, if you are research concerning on relationship, improvise, impact, blah, blah, and blah, that's applied research. So now we can see the SOP, standard operating procedures, easy. And then what's next? So that's why many of, uh, uh, I would say that um, uh, the impact journals, they will ask you then, if they say that your study is basic research, what research question that be suitable? So definitely I would say why and how? Why is the, yes, the basic question and why we need to how, need to have how, because how we solve that why? 
Okay, please check your thesis, my friend. I understand that a few are still writing, and then these are the things. Okay, so when we discuss about why and how, that actually is about what basic research, and other than why and how is belong actually. I would say that too. Applied research, and then what's next? Now we go to the methodology. Uh, actually, is uh, 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 I would say that the broad definition of methodology. But I, I, I make it scope like uh, if we talk about methodology. Okay, now it's a qualitative. So basic research actually with more prone on qualitative. However, applied is more on quantitative. So in Malaysia right now, many of uh, our students they are also struggling to understand quality, quantitative. What software that can be used for quantitative? And then they said that, okay, quantitative, I can use PLS SEM. We say, no, that's so wrong. We already referred to the statistician. And then seriously, PLS SEM or smart PLS is no good for quantitative. It's good for qualitative. Because of the why, if you have a chance to, to read hair, okay, hair articles, uh, published in Emerald's uh, publisher 2018, he mentioning that, okay, PLS SEM, there are certain characteristics. Why are you using that? Because number one, because of the model or any, any, any theory or anything that you introduce, something that very new, that's number one. And number two is that uh, we have a problem with the data. They say we don't have enough data, probably that less than 100. Okay, so that's why we are, yes, PLS SEM. Yeah. That's why partial least square. And then what's next? Okay, definitely the data abnormal, so problematic. You have a higher uh, courtesies, higher, uh, I would say that, yeah, uh, courtesies, skewness. So that's why we are actually using PLS SEM in order to solve this kind of data. Problematic. So what I want to say is that, okay, qualitative, yes, is best for basic research, quantitative is best for applied research. How about the combination? Yeah, that's why sometimes students confuse. They put the title as basic research, but come to the objective, most likely and applied. So how is it? So that's why they got school and then got major correction. So we need to, okay, see it okay, carefully and then do it. Uh, using the SOP. So what I want to say is that now, okay, we go to the findings. Basic research may concern about output, however, applied research concern on the outcome. Okay, so uh, for basic research, definitely we do not test the hypothesis. We come up with the prototype. We have proposition, okay, and still in the lab, we do the research. So that's the things about basic and fundamental, okay, and, and applied. The combination, okay, now actually we want to discuss a little bit on the triangulation. Okay, triangulation sometimes been uh, misinterpret. Uh, uh, when your supervisor asks you, let's say, to, okay, combine both method, let's say quantitative, qualitative. They say that, quote, triangulation. But triangulation can be, number one definition, simple thing is that, yes, normally we will combine quantitative, qualitative and quantitative, but sometimes, the method how you want to collect, probably among qualitative, you have focus group, you have expert review, you have, uh, we call that observation, we have experiment, you combine those and if you come in triangulation of the qualitative. So don't misunderstood with this definition. So that's why sometimes the student need to ask back to the supervisor, what is the meaning of triangulation? And sometimes when it comes to triangulations, Many students cannot answer why or justify why they are using triangulations. Okay, okay. Then uh, methodology, quantitative, quantitative triangulation development of model and instrumentation. So I already know about this, but single thing is that we need to know how to develop the models. Okay, we need to find it from where. Okay, we need to uh, discuss how actually it been formed. Okay. It's not just enough, we have one model and then that's enough. But we need to describe and also discuss in detail. How to discuss this? Definitely from the literature review. And many of the students, especially I would say, it, they not really do the literature review. 80%, they just do what? They, they read articles and then they compile, compile all these uh, findings and then they put in one place and then they report, that's it. 
So that's not we call that literature review. That's we call as literature search. That's the first step we do for literature review. After we have literature search, we compile, we put in one place, and then what's next? Synthesis. Critically, yes, do the literature. So what I want to say is that, okay, we need to do synthesis. Means at least we need to focus on three models, three theory, whatever, related to our studies. And then afterwards, yes, we will compare. And then after what we come up with our, yes, model. So that's the things. So I want to say is that literature review is really not a literature review right now. Okay, what we get from literature review is not literature review. And then one more thing, when we discuss about gap of knowledge, and suddenly we see that, you know what, when the student not really do the literature review, how they, how they can come up with the gap of knowledge. That's also confusing. So that's why we need to take a look on this seriously because without gap of knowledge, our friend, we cannot get our PhD. So that's the difference between PhD and normal research. So where we get gap of knowledge? Literature from the literature review. What is the literature review? We do the literature synthesis. And then, then we can actually come up with the gap of knowledge. Okay? So what's next? Nice? Okay, data analysis, interpretation, data scale, and so I think everybody know about it. And every single data scale that we do, that we study, we reflect direct to the descriptive analysis and also information analysis. Okay? So um, communications, definitely when you go to a conference, how you will deliver your, uh, I would say the presentations and by my boss, how you deal with the examiners, how you uh, uh, give a feedback to the examiners and how actually you do the project presentation in front of your boss, in front of uh, uh, colleagues, okay? And how actually you talk with the respondent, how you talk with the supervisor, and definitely if you are the consultant, how actually you give the advice to the, the companies or your, I would say, their clients, okay? And writings, I would say that definitely uh, we need to know how to uh, write a research proposal, especially to uh, PhD students. It's different when you write research proposal for a grant and also how to write the thesis, how to write articles, because it's so different between article, thesis, as well as proceedings and also book and chapters in books, okay? So logic, this is another thing that we need to consider because as a researcher, you need to have, yeah, I would say that, you know what, intuitions and based on your experience differently, I would say that your logic is probably you can improve, okay? For instance, um, there's a case that uh, when the student want to study on, let's say, uh, I would say that, uh, yes, uh, social media, okay? Social media usage and also the, uh, we call that uh, intelligence uh, 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 performance, something like that, okay? So emotional emotional performance, okay? So when this actually, you know, come to the Bible Boss exam, um, I try to understand this, okay? So social media uh, usage actually is about what, okay? When you talk about uh, Facebook, it's so different uh, between, uh, so different, uh, we call that uh, uh, targets, okay? Uh, who actually using Facebook, who actually using Instagram, who actually uh, using blog and so and so. So, so many social medias there, okay? So I want to say is that in this case, definitely the, 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 the student then realized that when actually they discuss on, uh, when he discuss on uh, Facebook, Facebook, uh, I would say target is actually uh, for people 30 and above, 30 and above, not 20 and above. Okay, logically, it must be 30 and above. But the data being collected from those who are, yes, I would say that younger, 25 below. So this is the things that we need to know, logics about the, we call that our research. So that's why it is one example. Uh, since that we don't have enough time, it's okay with that. Probably we can uh, have another session on this. But I want to say is in order to enhance the logic, a level of logics, okay? When we do research, definitely we need to read, okay? Read and read and read. And then inshallah, from there, we can improve your logic. I think that's it for today. Thank you very much for listening. And if they say that you want to uh, say hello or you want to contact me, inshallah, I try my best to uh, communicate with you by, uh, by WhatsApp probably. Uh, you can WhatsApp me at zero, 60126 double three three five.
Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Dr. Nurzaidi Haji Mohdaud for your insightful presentation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, now we come to the third speaker of plenary session two. We would have Professor Aris Junaidi, PhD, the Director General of Higher Education, Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology, Indonesia. Let me read his short biography. Professor Aris Junaidi pursued his doctoral degree in the field of reproductive endocrine cogi from Murdoch University, Western Australia in 1999. In 2007, he honored Endeavor Executive Award. He is appointed as head of management quality assurance at Gajah Mada University in 2008. In 2009 until 2012, he was cartel attaché in Indonesian Embassy to Australia in Canberra. In 2015 to 2019, he was Director of Quality Assurance at Ministry of Research Technology and Higher Education. Currently, he is the Director of Learning and Student Affairs of the Director General of Higher Education, Ministry of Education, Culture, Research and Technology. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Professor Aris Junaidi. Thank you, Ibu. Thank you so much for the introduction. Honorable uh, Rector of uh, uh, UNES uh, and also the Vice Rector and Honorable the Director of the Graduate School and the vice uh, director and all the distinguished speaker, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I would like to apologize that uh, our director agenda is cannot join this uh, very important conference. And now uh, myself as a director of the learning, student and learning affair uh, will be talk on behalf of him. Uh, this is regarding with our policy with related with the uh, seven international conference on science, education, and technology. Please allow me to share our PPT. So thank you. So since I am uh, the last uh, speaker here on the plenary session two, I would like to manage the time. It's about uh, 15 to maximum uh, 20 minutes uh, to uh, present it on high education policy concerning the digital, digital transformation upon the challenges and opportunity. A distinguished guest, ladies and gentlemen, as we are now uh, uh, on the 21st century and we are aware that we've got a challenge of our civilization, uh, starting with the society 5.0 and also uh, industry revolution of 4.0. The last uh, two years we are uh, very familiar with the internet of things, big data, AI, 5G network, or robot, as well of the cyber physical system. So uh, saying we've got these challenges, then uh, we uh, have the new policy, uh, how to, uh, to preparing our students uh, uh, so that uh, they can ready with the uh, challenges uh, that we are having now. I would like also start with the profile of the higher education institution in Indonesia. And now and the total of uh, the number of higher education institution in Indonesia is uh, 4,593. And this is consists of the university, a polytechnic, uh, and then a college, an academic, and also polytechnic. And uh, uh, we also running about the total study program. We've got uh, 34. 1,171. We've got lecturer in total is around 286,000 and the, the number of active, active students is around 8.7 million. 
So that means uh, we have uh, based on this statistic uh, showing that uh, the number of higher education institutions in Indonesia is very huge. And if we've got, uh, got a start, uh, student body here, and the total is 8.7 million. A distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, if we are talking uh, with the uh, university here and the lecturer, we cannot, uh, uh, we always uh, talking about the three dharma yeah, in uh, high education. This is very unique in the, the university in Indonesia because the three dharma here is an a engine of sustained growth. And also if we uh, can got here between uh, uh, education, uh, research, and also um, uh, what we call it, pengabdian uh, kepada masyarakat, engagement of the community. So that means the education here is a leader and human capital entrepreneur. So uh, related with the well-being, uh, productivity, and also competitiveness. On the research, as uh, the two speaker is uh, very uh, detailed in, 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 in sharing uh, with us about the type of the research and how to get the, the, the best uh, research and uh, publication. And here, here uh, and the second dharma here is invention and also innovation, uh, science and also uh, 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 yeah. Yeah. So business, industry, economy, and also in the society. As well as the uh, engagement of the community here, uh, community and also society. So that means the unique uh, three dharma here is a, uh, is a, a cannot be avoided uh, through our uh, lecturer in the university. And our new policy here is also encouraging all the higher education institution is uh, implemented what we call it uh, the campus of, of sun. Yeah. Sun so that means a sehat, aman, and nyaman, or healthy campus. So that means healthy campus is uh, no drug, uh, no smoke. Yeah. So healthy and the spiritual environment and also uh, 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 sehat jasmani. So that means healthy 